what's going on, everybody? Hi, welcome to the program. It's the Jeff Gersman Show for January 9th, 2024. I'm your host for this week's edition of the show. My name is Jeff Gersman. I'm happy to be here. Pisces. No, I'm not. I don't know. So I'm a Leo, but it's not funny. Like when you're, you know, when you're doing the like, you know, sleazy seventy, introduce yourself with your astrological sign. Leo is not a funny sign to say. It's what are the funny signs? It's Pisces, Sagittarius. That might be it. That might be it. Aquarius, maybe. Aquarius is kind of on the bubble there. I don't know. Aquarius, maybe. Sagittarius, I think, is definitively the funniest astrological sign to to say. Like when if you're writing a scene and you have to have a character is a fucking open shirt, gold chain creep. Well, that's I mean, that's what the state did. I mean, that's just that's just the state thing. That's just the Barry and Levon like uh uh two hundred and forty dollars worth of pudding thing. Like they do that there. Sagittarius. Oh yeah, yeah. They just do that. Um, anyway, just watch the state. Still good. Still good. Been catching it here and there. Been watching a little. They re, you know, they re-released it without the music, and uh, and then uh, you know, you could find old VHS rips with the music. I had, uh, I had a, a I the magazine I worked for back in like '94. Uh, the, the receptionist, she gave me a VHS tape that had every episode of the state on it. Uh, and I still have that somewhere. Um, she also taught me the term hubba rock, uh, as a, as a, uh, as a, a, a you, as a, for, as a, as a slang term for crack hubba learned a lot back then. Anyway. Yeah, Pat Bear says Viva Variety is underrated. I did I did not like Viva Variety when it was on the air. When Viva Variety first came on, I was like, I don't it's not I want to like this show very much, but it is not doing it for me. Um but I uh I very much want to watch Viva Variety now, all these years later to kind of see uh, you know, how it's uh you know how it how it hits how it strikes me all these years later i bet i would like it quite a bit more uh than i than i did then that's uh that's my basic feeling on that um but as far as mtv shows and vhs tapes and all that stuff i mean i, I still think syphil and ollie is the kind of gold standard for that programming though i would accept copies of you wrote it you watch it <laughs> that that would be uh there's a boat there's a there's something about boat shoes in a sketch on a you wrote it you watch it episode that i uh yeah back in uh 07 early 08 when we were talking about starting a video game website and what we should what we should do to do it the the idea of doing puppets the idea of basically doing syphil and ollie style coverage of video games um came up that's where the whole like video game mountain thing uh if you've heard if you've heard of the domain name video game mountain that was that was the the idea that it kind of coalesced around that was if we got a bunch of different puppet characters and uh and they all lived on different parts of video game mountain and so different parts of the mountain would bring you different coverage of different types of games and all that sort of stuff um, and we ended up not going in that direction. I think that would have been fun, but I think that would have been, I don't know that that would have lasted the same way you would have had to, you would have had to have also done the stuff that we ended up doing <laughs> as ourselves. Like you would have had to have do, done a bunch of out of character stuff as well. And, and at that point. Like you're kind of, you know, you're forsaking the bit uh, a bunch and, um, and, and, you know, it kind of, I don't, I don't think that that would, I don't think that that would work. Um, though I do think like E3 coverage would have been really fun because you would have been bringing puppets to E3 and 
having puppet conversations with game developers, like like all of those, all of that stuff sounded really fun. Right up until you st probably started doing it, and you're like, "God, this is ridiculous." Boy, my back hurts. So I have to crouch down to. And then, like the the, the year after that, um, they brought Sifo and Ollie back specifically to do video game reviews for like, was it game trailers that did that, or was it Machinima? Or, uh, like, like they they did some Sifo and Ollie bits that were video game focused, and they were so they were not good. They were so not good. It was so depressing. Um, it was so, it was so depressing to see that because on one hand it was like, oh man, I think that we could have executed on that way better than what they did. I mean, we wouldn't have had, we would not have had the characters of Syphil and Ollie. We would not have had the, the same exact sense of humor as Syphil and Ollie. I don't think either, but, um, because I mean, that's a, that's a whole thing, right? I mean, but, um, but I think that's what would have made it work. Um, is that we would have understood the content and understood the material much better. And so it's like, oh, it's not as funny, but at least it's accurate and at least it's useful information or, or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, I think that would have been fun, but uh, it, yeah, that would have... That would not have worked. Uh, that that would, would not have worked. Yeah, uh, no, so Liam Lynch's... Uh, uh, like Lynchland stuff, like all the... All of Liam Lynch's vape material where he talks about the dark vape and all of that is, is really is beautiful stuff. Like he's that guy's made so many crazy things and put them online and barely anybody saw any of it. It's weird that you're like, oh, man, this is, like, this is the guy behind Sif One All. He put out that album. He put out, he put out multiple albums. Some were funny. Some were not uh, by design. I don't mean to say that like whatever, but um. Uh, anyway, that was a really good idea. That would have been a really bad idea. Um, because it just would have, yeah, I, I think you, 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 you bump up against the limits of it really quickly when you're also trying to do credible coverage of video games. Like, okay, well I'm doing credible coverage of video games, but in the context of a moonshiner who lives a third of the way up the mountain, uh, and he's got a whole voice and accent and all this other stuff. And like, it's just, yeah, that stuff breaks down real fast. Um, speaking of breaking down real fast, well, I guess actually technically it broke down real slow. My CDI, here it is right here. If you're watching the video version, I set it up. I set it up over the weekend, uh, updated the firmware on my old Retro Tink 5X Pro over here, and uh, hooked it all up, and everything was working, and I was playing, uh, you know, Link the Faces of Evil, and it's terrible, it's a terrible game. And I was like, man, this CDI works great. The door, the, the, the drive mechanism is a little slow, and it makes a crazy noise, but, um, but other than that, it works. And so I said, well, time to start burning discs. And so I went and I bought a spindle of blank CDs and, uh, and got to burning. And uh, yesterday the CDs showed up and I burned a copy of the 1994 CDI Video Awards because I knew that that was something that required the digital video cartridge uh, for the CDI. And I needed to test that that thing was in there and it worked and, and everything. Um, and it, and as in a process of doing that, it didn't work. It, yeah, I don't know. The, it, the, the disc didn't work super well, so it might have been a bad burn. Amazing that in 2024, we still have bad burns. I mean, no one ever had the incentive to fix, like, to, to like fix that process, but you still have people going, like, no, you need to burn it at 2x speed. Otherwise, it'll, it won't work and blah, blah, blah. Like, this drive will not burn at 2x speed. 16 is the lowest it goes. Um, Anyway, long story short, the the drive the 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 powered disc tray finally gave up um, and no longer opens and closes on its own. The problem with that is you can force it. You can you know I I grabbed a pair of uh, fingernail clippers and pried it under there and pulled it open and 
and pulled it open and was able to shut it and all that sort of stuff. But the problem is when you shut it, it doesn't stay shut. It pops back out. So unless I stand there with my thumb on the drive thing, holding it in place, it pops out and it will no longer read the disc. And so I was sitting there yesterday holding it in place going, this sucks. This thing is hosed, man. Um, I guess the, 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 the belt on the drive uh, is prone to going bad. The, the belt there is, is constantly, um, that is, that is a common CDI problem specifically. And, uh, so I yesterday found myself on a random website I had never heard of that is selling like capacitors and all of this other stuff for old consoles and, and arcade hardware and all this other stuff. And they had replacement belts for, for this model of CDI. So I'm going to get a tiny rubber ring in the mail at some point in the near future for, you know, $7 shipped. And, uh, and there's a YouTube video of someone replacing it that I watched the first half of it. And I was like, that seems like something I could maybe do. I don't know. Or maybe it'll just end up broken. It's already broken. So I'm going to, you know, either I send it off to someone now or I spend a little time, hopefully not breaking it worse and maybe fix it, and then I can send it off to someone later. I do need to send it off to someone at some point because the battery on it is dead. The, these CDIs, the Timekeeper chip, um, is, uh, is apparently prone to going bad. I mean, it's a battery, so uh, you know, of course it's going to go bad, but replacing it is apparently a massive nightmare and, and not something for this easy for normal people to do and... Uh, and, and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, I, yeah, I don't really know what the, what I'm going to end up having to do there eventually, but th there's also, while we're talking CDI mods, uh, there's also a, um, a, a solder in board that is an optical drive emulator. It's not available yet, but the person who made the same thing for the 3DO which is down there near the bottom, um, is also making a board that you and and, and that's the the that's what you want, right? Is because then I can just copy all of these CDI discs that I have on this hard drive over to an SD card and then put it in there, and then we could all play the Thunder in Paradise game for three minutes and then go, God, why did we do this? Why did we spend hundreds of dollars getting this CDI back in shape? <laughs> it's a CDI. I can watch this German copy of Top Gun on it. Um, so that that's the that's the hole I've been going down. I have another CDI unit that I uh, will probably swap in, but I I don't think it's a Magnavox unit that I don't think it does not have S video out, so the 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 video quality will be worse. And also, um. I don't think it has support. I, I don't think it has a place to put the MPEG card, the the DVC, the digital video cartridge card, whatever it is, um, whatever that add-on is. I don't think it has space for that. So, um, so unfortunately, uh, it, it's an inferior device uh, across the board. But um, yeah. The CDI is a, the, the, the CD interactive format is ridiculous, but I mostly just want to look at Volvo service manuals on what was sold as a video game machine because <laughs> it also uh, got some enterprise use out there. It's basically the hollow lens of its day. So that's what I've been up to. Let's get to the news. Xbox games, you tend to run them on an Xbox, though these days people tend to run them on a PC as well. Um, there has been some, some smoke on the streets. I don't, you know, th there's been a, a kind of a, a growing talk, a growing discussion around this, uh, but over the weekend it kind of uh, whipped up a little bit into something getting a little more specific. Um, the idea of bringing Xbox exclusive games 
to other platforms and what might those games be and what might those platforms be and and so on and so forth there's been uh, you know depending on which version of the story you're reading it's uh you know could it be sea of thieves that is something that steven Tatillo has reported that uh, a while ago he had heard that they were investigating and, and thinking about the idea of bringing uh, Sea of Thieves to other platforms, whether it's you know Switch and Play. Well, I assume I assume that means Switch and PlayStation Five. Um, Totillo points out in his uh, GameFile dot news newsletter, um, <clears throat> which he just recently started. Um, that uh, Nintendo did, or, uh, that Microsoft did bring Ori to the Switch uh, a while ago, um, or that you know that was a game that originally debuted on on Xbox consoles, rather. Um, <clears throat> and then there's been talk that maybe Sea of Thieves is happening, and maybe it's happening sooner rather than later, as an early 2024 thing. If you start getting a little further out there into uh, less known sources and stuff like that. You start hearing that, uh, that it's much bigger than that. And that hi-fi rush is a game that's potentially coming. And that Starfield is potentially coming multi uh, to a, uh, to a multi-platform device near you. Uh, Jess Corden of windows central kind of weighed in on this a little bit and said the de you know, it sounds like the, you know, as far as he's concerned, the details are very vague, but that there has been thought put into bringing, some of the of those back catalog older games to other platforms. Um, whereas, again, if you start to look at the far flung versions of this, you start to see things like, oh, by the way, it, it's done. Like this is Xbox is about to become a third party publisher across the board, day and date, blah blah blah. This is why they didn't say that. Uh, uh, Blade was an Xbox exclusive, and this is why you know the, this is why the you know, as, after the Call of Duty deal was done, and that's going to stay multi platform. Then at that point, if you're making your biggest games multi platform, why not make them all multi platform? You know, the, there's there's just been a lot of um, a lot of loose talk around it. Uh, Totillo contacted Xbox and uh, got a kind of a no comment on on that whole thing. Um, so if you take all of this together, um, it's a lot, it's a lot of talk. There's enough discussion around it that you go, well, some, some version of this, um, some version of this is bound to be true. Right. There is there is some version of this where this does start to make sense. And I think the thinnest version of it, the the kind of like non story version of it is, hey, yeah, I don't know. We're going to put see if these on the switch and PlayStation because eh, why not? Uh, you're like, OK, yeah, I guess that, I guess that makes sense. Like see if these is not a free game. You know, it might make more sense in some cases to do free to play games and, and all of that. But like it is ultimately an online game. Uh, that needs as many players as possible to keep, you know, to stay relevant, to stay afloat, uh, as they as they say in the in the pirate world. Um, and so you could see a reasoning for like, hey, yeah, why don't we, um, why don't we just put some of these games on other platforms? And they have said that they'll do it where it makes sense, right? And they'll they'll keep games multi platform where it makes sense. That was always the justification used around stuff like Minecraft and some of the stuff that came up in the court case around Call of Duty was, you know, this this idea of just like, well, you know, where it makes sense to do so that we we will we will publish on multiple platforms. And this has happened the other way, really only just the one time uh, per per right. Um, where MLB the show comes to multiple platforms now, that is something where MLB forced Sony's hand on that and said hey, uh, it's it's ridiculous, the idea that this is only on one platform. It should be on all of them. Make it happen. Um, or we will we will do the... We will make it port... The ports happen, whatever. I don't know what the actual arrangement is there. But, um, but with baseball coming to multiple platforms. And then I guess on the Nintendo end of things, it's really just kind of golden high or something, right? Where that's kind of a weird hybrid um, where Nintendo does hold a piece of the golden eye puzzle. 
um, with that coming to um, Xbox, I guess. Um, there was talk, yeah, the, the, the previous version of these rumors were around the idea of Game Pass coming to other platforms, um, which to put Game Pass out on other platforms, first you have to have the games there, right? Um, but in addition to that, could they do it as a streaming only service and say like, oh yeah, if you want to play our games, you can play them, um, via X cloud on a PlayStation. Like, yeah, they, they, maybe they could do that, but you know, that's maybe they don't really want to, to do that. There was some work at some point done on multiple versions of Starfield before the, before the Microsoft Bethesda deal closed, uh, or rather that was a Redfall, right? Redfall was the one that I think Harvey Smith kind of gave the, the quote about, which at the time didn't land super well. Um, but uh, one would assume that uh, Starfield was at some point a multi-platform game with the length of time it was in development and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but... Uh, Yeah, it, it's uh, it's hard to say where this goes from here. It it it's I could I could I guess I look at this, I look at everything that's out there, and I kind of sit back and think about it, and I I could believe any version of it to be honest. Like I think that when you look at where the Xbox hardware is with Sony, you know, supposedly outselling them three to one, and you know, like Sony's out there saying we've sold fifty million PlayStation fives, we've done this, we've done that, like. You know, and, and last generation went the same way, uh, if though probably worse. They're, they're, the Xbox is probably not doing the same level of poorly that it was then. Poorly is a strong word. I, I don't even, you know, it's, it's, it seems like it's going okay. It just, when you look at the overall numbers, the, the market is spoken worldwide, the market is spoken, and they are choosing PlayStation. So at some point, if you're making these games, and they are expensive games to make. This kind of ties in a little bit to some of the discussion we've had lately around budgets uh, for big games and how do you recoup that budget and how do you make sure these games are profitable. The answers are simple. You put those games in front of as many potential customers as you possibly can. Um, or you have to be willing to lose some of that money and hope that you make it up in hardware sales on the other side. Of like, well, okay. Like Halo Infinite is not going to appear on a PlayStation, but hopefully that will draw people to buy an Xbox. Hopefully that will draw people to sign up for Game Pass so that they can play the campaign. Hopefully that you know, like it touches different parts of their business. The same way we were talking about in a more ephemeral way, uh, the, some of the Spider-Man 2 stuff where you're like, oh, Spider-Man's a big enough IP. The previous game was well, was extremely well liked that Spider-Man 2 being a PlayStation 5 um, only game. Um, helps sell hardware so even if it doesn't raw like even if it doesn't recoup its costs on a raw sales of that game basis which it will presumably over time um they can also back into some other numbers like well we discovered that an x number of these spider-man bundles sold and then those players went on to buy four more games and so our fees from that are this and this and that so it works out in the long run blah 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 um but also they'll eventually put that game out on PC and so they'll get another bump of money then. Um, or the, did they actually, did they already do it? <laughs> no, Spider-Man 2 is not out on PC yet. Uh, Miles, Miles Mayhem. The Mask game starring Miles Mayhem. That game. The Mask games on the Spectrum were terrible. Anyway. Um, so, you know, presumably they eventually put that game out on PC and it gets another bump of sales there. Now envision some weird, weird world, you know, if we go shoe on the other foot here for just a second, um, that they also put it out on Xbox for another bump of sales. That is sort of the situation we're talking about with, with a Microsoft. Um, if, if they do decide to go this route, right. Um, they may not have enough sales, you know, like, like, sure. They can look at the PC and they can say, Hey, uh, there are a billion Windows, you know, however many Windows machines that are capable of running their games. Those are potential sales, right? But nah, not you can't count on that. And so you have to look at like how many Xboxes have we sold? 
plus the kind of like PC version of those numbers, which is not, you know, like uh, uh, the, the entire addressable audience on PC is not interested in our games. So whatever. Um, and maybe they're at a point. I mean, we, we talk about some of the Microsoft games not feeling as big as they used to. Um, maybe that's why is because they know they won't make their money back on them, especially in a game pass era where, you know, they, they can, maybe they've, squoze in all the juice out of people that they can for like hey if you want to play our big games you should sign up for game pass maybe everyone already said yeah cool we're gonna do that and so it's you know getting harder and harder to sway people with a new release you know you get the key people to kind of churn in and out on a subscription service where they sign up and play starfield and then they get back out um but for people that, that sign up and stay signed up Maybe they're starting to see like a, a a certain wall on that, and maybe that informs some of their budgetary decisions. And, and presumably, it does. I mean, everything has to be data driven up to a point. They can't just like fully go with their gut. They're Microsoft. Uh, they don't get to go with their gut at that size <laughs> anymore. Uh, past a certain point. Um. So. Is what Microsoft is doing, is what they're doing working for them? Potentially up to a point, could it be working better? Sure. Uh, could you get another hit of sales? Could you get another burst of energy around your games if you put them out on PlayStation? Yes, absolutely. So, if you remove all of the comp competition, all the competitive aspects of this. If you strip all of that away and go, go into it a little more humble, a little more like what's the, what's the right move for the business? What is best for business as opposed to, um, you know, just kind of maintaining the console wars or for the, just for the sake of it or, or whatever else. You know, you, you start to open those doors. You start to think about it. And I'm sure that they have thought about it. Uh, what their next moves are, what their actions are on those thoughts, we'll see. But, you know, remember, we, we, were, we were looking at those emails from Phil Spencer um, from, like, 2019, where he was trying to, you know, like, it was, it was focused on the xCloud streaming stuff on phones. It wasn't really tackling this problem. But it was a similar thing of just like, you know, I can't I can't figure out how to make this business make sense for the the audience on mobile. I can't figure out how to make that, you know, like like there, there were just aspects of it where you're like, OK, we have this really cool technology. But like, what is what does that mean? Do people care about it? Does it solve a problem? All of this other stuff. So after years of thinking that stuff through, after years of thinking through, like, could we get Game Pass on Switch? Could we get X Cloud on Switch? Like, you know. Like going down those roads because they they have gone down some of those roads and at least thought about it. Um, do they eventually get to a point where they're like, actually, it makes the most sense for us to just put our games everywhere, um, and just have that as a policy that probably solves some of the antitrust stuff if they if they were to go buy more developers if they were suddenly very very platform agnostic then that would uh. That would help clear that up a little bit. The catch here is I don't think they necessarily have to get out of the hardware business to do this. Um, because ultimately, I think it still makes sense for them to have Game Pass. I think it still makes sense for them to keep Game Pass on their own platform. Uh, or, or rather, one would presume that Game Pass would be best on an Xbox or PC. Because otherwise, you can only... Like game game pass on a PlayStation, um, you're probably not getting as many developers to sign up for it, right? You're you're maybe going like, oh, well, we'll sell our game on PlayStation as we always have. We'll go into Game Pass over here on your stuff, but maybe it doesn't make sense for us to put third party games onto this third party, like like uh, uh, you know, if if you're a third party looking at like being in a subscription service on PlayStation, you probably sign a deal with Sony and go on their service as opposed to being on Microsoft's version of it that is on Sony platforms, right? Like, 
unless the deal is better and and then we're in a a different race right we're in a subscription services race but sony would probably have a thing or two to say about a subscription race that was happening on their own platform uh and maybe they wouldn't allow it in the first place but they had but if Microsoft is approaching it as a true third party, like Sony has allowed Ubisoft Plus and EA Play to appear on their platform. So it wouldn't be that different from one of those um, when, uh, when all is said and done. Uh, you could make the argument that like Game Pass, if Game Pass became a true multi-platform service and it showed up on the the successor to the switch if it showed up on the playstation 5 and 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 all of that that maybe that becomes a a sweeter deal for some of these third parties that are becoming a part of game pass but i i don't it's uh i don't really know i don't really know i don't have i don't have that data i i could you could make that argument either way uh you would need the data to to sway that argument one way or the other and, and i and i do not have that um But I think like th this burst of news here and, and kind of the the more far flung versions of it where they basically, you know, the, the far flung versions of this rumor are practically saying that, you know, hey, the the Xbox brand or, or Microsoft is about to become basically a third party. Um, like I said, I don't think that Microsoft necessarily has to get out of the hardware business to make that happen. But. I do think like if if they were to go down that road would there be another Xbox? Would there be a uh would there be a, a follow up to the Xbox Series X? Or would they just kind of retreat from that end of the hardware business, focus on the PC versions being their kind of like first and foremost big ones and then just appear on PlayStation and appear on Nintendo? Maybe. I think that there are still, okay, here's, here's what I would probably, here's what I would do. Assuming that all of this makes sense and all of the money adds up, right? I mean, that's a big if, but I think if you wanted to become a third party, I think you would still make hardware, but I don't think you would make a closed platform. And what I mean by that is, I think that there's value in the Xbox name. I think there's value in the Xbox brand as a device you buy and put under your television. Uh, how much value? Probably not as much as PlayStation. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation in the first place, right? But I, I would make this, this would be a Windows machine, which is already, you know, the, hey, the current Xbox is not that different from a PC, the parts inside, blah, blah, blah. I would just take that thing and I would run... I would have a consoleized version of Windows uh, and I would allow people to run Steam on it and I would basically make an open machine and say, hey, it's another Windows machine. This one hooks up to your TV. It's got a good media center in it. And it's, you know, basically Valve's idea for the Steam machine or it's, you know, or whatever. But you're making it in something, in some kind of box that is not going to be as high range as a full-on desktop PC but it's something that you could sell for in somewhere in that $500 range and, and put under a television and people could play games on it and people could play your X cloud stuff and people could play that, you know, like, like all of that sort of stuff for people that want that version of the experience, right? You would need to button up the OS a whole lot. You couldn't just like plug it in and turn it on and have it boot up to like a windows 11 or windows 12 screen and have people go like, uh, wait, what? I got to plug in a mouse. Like, no, you, you would have to, do a lot of work, but it sounds like that Microsoft is already willing to do some of that work for some of the uh, handheld devices that are running Windows, of which another one was announced just this week, the MSI Claw. Uh, but, you know, the, these kind of handheld PCs are already kind of... Um, already kind of demanding uh, more of Windows 11 than it's currently capable of. And so they already need to come up with a more controller friendly version of windows that is good at running games. That is blah, blah, blah. So it would be probably pretty easy for Microsoft to turn the Xbox dashboard, the Xbox front end into an application. Um, 
that integrates all of your Windows Store purchases and so on and so forth. Perhaps has a good little shunt to integrate your Steam library. Like a lot of these other... Like if someone made a good one of those, it would be good. But no one's made a good one of those yet. It's all the, the what, the, the armory crate thing that... Uh, that Asus uses, and that thing sucks. Um, so anyway, I, I think you could you could do something, and you could brand it Xbox, and say like, "This is our gaming machine meant for televisions. It is fully open. <clears throat> it is it is just a fucking Windows machine. If you want to install Steam OS on it, go for it. If you want to install Linux on it and throw it in a closet and use it to mine, like whatever. It's just a computer." Uh, but one that is better configured and more intelligently configured for uh, a television experience and, and and blah, blah, blah. I could see that being the way forward for Microsoft with hardware if they do decide to just become a full-on third party. Because Microsoft does still make hardware. You know, they, they... It feels like they make it in fits and starts. But, like, they were making those Surface tablets. They they do little things here and there. And, you know, if, if they uh, also... If the next big push for Windows is going to be AI focused, um, an AI focused, cloud focused, blah blah blah, then that could be a box that sits under your TV and has a micro a microphone on it. And you go, hey, Chat GPT, eat my butt, and then it responds. I asked Microsoft Copilot last night how to uninstall Microsoft Copilot, and it told me. So I did. Um, so thanks to Microsoft Copilot for being so useful. You have to use the group policy editor, which is not something that, uh, you know, if you have pro versions or enterprise versions of Windows, you, you have access to the group policy editor. I think if you have a Windows home license, you may not be able to do that. Um, but you could probably reg edit it, I'm sure, um, to, to get it out of there. I don't need that shit in my life, man. Like Siri's bad, like a better Siri, a better uh, Alexa or whatever. Like, sure, I, I guess. But like Siri has been so shitty for so long that I don't, I don't want to talk to my fucking phone. I don't want to talk to my fucking computer. I don't want to fucking talk. I don't want to, I, I don't want to use fucking voice commands. All of this shit has sucked for too long. And it still sucks. Like, make no mistake. It's still fucking bad. The only thing I ever say to uh, a Siri is, wake me up in half an hour. And I don't even, I'm not even using, like, even that's a fucking, like, I have to, like, cudgel together that phrase. Because I'm not setting it as an alarm for sleeping. I just need to set a 30-minute timer because I just put an energy drink in the freezer. And I don't want to leave it there. And if I say set a timer for 30 minutes and blah, blah, like it, it asks me, it pops up a different interface. So if I just say, wake me up in half an hour, it does it and it, and, and it's done. In fact, I use, I use it so often that now there's a thing that pops up on my phone screen that just says Siri shortcut, set a timer for 30 minutes and I can just tap it and the timer starts. So I don't even have to fucking talk to it anymore. It's great. Um, you know, yeah, but it's, it's math problems. It's, uh, metric conversions. It's, it's, uh, how many pints are in a court. It's, you know, the simple household stuff or where is where a voice assistant seems to make the most sense. My wife tries to use it a lot more than I do. She tries to use Siri a lot more than I do because she wears her, she wears AirPods a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, is asking it questions about, you know, like, like, and, and half the time it doesn't respond to her and she's just like, fuck this. What the fuck? So that stuff's been so shitty for so long. And, and the idea of just like chat GPT as a whole, I don't, I sure. Maybe that's the interface of the future. And, and, and I get the idea of, I, I you know, it, I get the idea. I want to do the Simon Phoenix thing. I want to be able to walk into a room and say, illuminate, de-illuminate. Of course, everyone does. 
but um, the switches work fine too. The light switch works works great. You don't. It's it's not. These are not problems that actually need solving. And so all of this AI shit, all of this uh, this this AI voice assistant stuff specifically, you know the the rest of it is a whole different ball of wax, right? But um. The idea that people are like falling over themselves to to try to and and you just read all these news stories like uh, iOS 18, Apple's really looking to level up on the AI stuff. They've been really quiet about it, but everyone else is doing this stuff, so they got to do it too. It's like this, this, this. Do people actually fucking want this shit? Like, is is this actually something that's solving a problem for people? Is this something that that is that's actually um improving our interactions with technology and making this shit work better or faster, uh, less of a hassle, less, you know, it's in, in most people's cases, it really seems like no. And you've got some people that are like, I used the, I asked chat GPT to write me a Python script to do this. And it did it. And I'm like, that's cool. Like, okay. Yeah. I don't know how to fucking write a Python script, but also because I don't know how to write a Python script, I sure as fuck I'm not going to trust some fucking random Python script spit out by a goddamn computer that can't even get basic fucking facts about history correct. Um, so I, the whole thing, the, the, the idea that, that this is where so many companies are spending their money and, and spending their focus and trying to invest in so heavily and stuff, it's just so depressing. You just look at it and go like, this is not, this, this fucking who cares? Um, it, it's, it's, it's real silly. And so of course, like the, you know, chat GPT people are now getting sued by the New York times and other places. Cause obviously they had to scrape all of these services to, to build their stupid robot. Um, they had to go and get that data from somewhere. And so like now all the places that they are very clearly getting some of their data from are saying, Oh, actually you're, you're basically stealing that. That's we, we are going to sue you for it. And open AI's response was, Oh, if, if it had to abide by copyright, if it had, if it had, if it had to abide by that, it couldn't exist. Like, all right, cool. The reaction to that should be like, cool. All right, good. Shut it down. Then I guess dumbass. Maybe you shouldn't have fucking spent all this money making this thing then. If you're like, ah, oh, we made this thing and it, yeah, I mean, yeah, it breaks the law, but we couldn't make it if it didn't break the law. Like, okay. Then don't. Then shut it off, I guess. That's it. End game. Fucking wrap it up. Motherfucker. Uh, I have been locked out of... Now see if I can use my voice to log back into Notion which randomly decided to log me out just now, you know, maybe that would be something. Um, I logged back in and it didn't keep my uh, settings and now it's white background instead of black background. This is the fucking disaster. I should install Obsidian. The lesson I'm learning here is to abandon... <laughs> <laughs> it, it updated and reinstalled... Uh, because it wanted to put an ad for Notion AI in front of me. Get in front of the line with the Notion AI add-on. Subscribe to Notion AI. Use it for writing and autofills today. We're fucked, man. Like, it's a desperate... And, and CES kind of calls this into sharp relief, right? Because CES is um, where we see the future of technology, right? And the future of technology is gigantic TVs as it always is. And people integrating chat GPT into stupid shit. Um, and then trying to charge money for it. They're like, you need to get out. I mean, it costs money to do this. So you should really pay us to like, Hey, uh, do you want help writing? Like, no, not really. The, the writing was never the hard part. I mean, I don't know what, no, no, I'm good. Um. Anyway, just a little bit more on the this idea of Xbox games going to other platforms. Um. 
I think the the console war mentality is uh is poisonous. It's stupid. Um it always was. Uh, at the same time, I think if the Xbox brand were to go away, I would go like, oh man, that's kind of a, you know, I don't know, that, that feels, that feels wrong. Um, but, um, I, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's hard to feel, you know, I don't, I don't feel sorry for, you know, like you, you, you look at it and go like, yeah, if that's what's best for business, do it. They should do that. Um, if it makes the most sense for Microsoft to start putting video games out across all platforms, do it like that. In some ways, that's a very much a put your money where your mouth is sort of move on their part because, you know, they've stated multiple times they've had people get up and talk into microphones and say that they don't think that exclu third party exclusives are great for the business and, and so on and so forth. Like, all right, cool. Let's go further. First party exclusives are the real problem. Put every game everywhere. Put every game everywhere, right? I mean, in, in, a, in a streaming focused future, every game would be everywhere anyway. So if the streaming future is not ready for us because it doesn't run quite well enough and blah, 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 then port the games, I guess. You know? Let's, let's get it over with. Let's, let's be accelerationists on this one hyper specific issue and, uh, and, and move forward. Right. Um, cause the goal, especially if, if budgets are going to keep getting more expensive, eventually the goal has to be put your game in front of as many people as you possibly can, whether that's via a streaming service on phones, whether that's, you know, you're porting the games to other platforms, like at the end of the day, if they're running a business and they are, then they should be trying to get their, their games in front of as many people as possible or monetize them in, in various ways, which again is where we, we back into the services side of like, Oh, well, yeah, I mean, more people might've played Starfield if we had shipped it on PlayStation, but also we got a ton of people to sign up for game pass and X percent of them stuck around. Like if maybe that's a smarter way for them to make their money. And that's why I look at, these rumors and the widespread of like everything from, Hey, see if these is going to come to switch and PlayStation potentially all the way up to fuck it. Everything's coming everywhere. And you like, you know what? I could believe business cases for any one of those, but I don't have access to the numbers. So it may be that there's some hybridized version of this that makes the most sense. And, and that's the direction they go in or, Potentially, this is all bullshit, right? And maybe, maybe Microsoft spent a bunch of time doing the math and crunching numbers and going like, okay, and maybe, and see if these would be a great test case for that to really sit down and think about like, okay, we're monetizing players at this rate and this many players are playing it and cosmetics, we potentially do this, this, and this. If we were to, to do the game this way and sell it this way instead, we think it might be this successful and it would cost us this much to port it and blah, blah, blah. And maybe they did all those numbers and started doing some of the work and said, no, actually we're, we don't, we don't think this is the, the, the right way forward for all we know, this could be old news. Um, but it, you know, but it is coming on the heels of people saying like, oh yeah, that that's like an early 2024 thing. See if these coming to, to other platforms, which doesn't sound that old. Um, so that's a long winded way of saying we'll see, but I guess I, I can't say I'm against it. Um, it's different from when Sega bailed out when Sega bailed out, they ran away. Like they were running from a fire because they kind of were the dreamcast. Um, failed to catch on in the marketplace. Uh, to a to a massive degree, it it was fighting the PlayStation Two before the PlayStation Two was even like announced, let alone come out. Like like they were fighting the boogeyman, the specter of another PlayStation. Um, back when the Dreamcast first even launched, right? 
And so the the entire run of the Dreamcast was under this dark shadow um, of a hedgehog with guns. No. Um, was under this, this dark shadow of the PlayStation 2. And so when Sega made those moves, it seemed very different because... And, and I we ended up I ended up hearing about it a much different way. Um, it was very hard to believe, um, because it just seemed like it, it, because the, the 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 news came in the form of well yeah so I, so we were you know like I was not in the news department but uh, someone who was also not in the news department came in basically. Uh, someone on the team was, uh, ha ha their partner was doing PR for a claim and, um, at some point must have seen this information because they live together and, and whatever. And basically they started crafting a news story that was like, Hey, a claim is getting set to publish crazy taxi taxi on PlayStation two. And like Jet said, it was like it was like three games. I think is what it was. Basically saying that like, uh, hey, a, a claim is about to announce um, that they are putting these Sega games out on PlayStation platforms. And it was like, well, fucking what? Um, and they wanted to run the story because they knew it was true. Because why? You know, they they had seen they had seen the details. Um, but we couldn't get a second source on it. There was, it was a gigantic internal conflict. Um, it was a gigantic internal conflict of like, that's not, th this is a really shitty source for a story. This is really, this is a fucking incredibly bad precedent to be like looking over your partner's shoulder or whatever the fuck the situation was on that one. Um, uh, and, and using that to, to, put this story out and, and the, the person with this information was being a little fishy about the source and didn't necessarily want to come out and say all of that stuff, um, at first. And, but like, Oh, we know it's true. We need to run it. We know it's true. And, and, and it was this really, it, it, it got pretty nasty. I stayed out of the whole thing generally because I was not on the news team. And, um, I think I was, I think, you know, like my general feeling on it now is probably the same as what it was. It's just like, this seems fucking fishy as fuck. Um, also, and also what they're doing, what, uh, cause the whole, like the news was so crazy. You're like, this is, this can't possibly be true. Like, there's no fucking way like a claim. Like what, you know, it was, it was just like a lot of stuff that's just like, this seems like a, a fucking ridiculous. Like this seems impossible what you're telling me. Um, because you know, it didn't come with any of the other information around like, by the way, the dreamcast is done. It was just like, Hey, some of these dreamcast games are coming to PlayStation two and a claim was going to be the publisher slash distributor of these games, but they weren't necessarily doing the development. They weren't doing the ports themselves or, or anything like that. And I don't know if that ended up being the case. If a claim got involved in why well, I don't crazy taxi. I don't think ever plans changed pal, I guess is the, the version on that, on that one. Um, and so that fight got nasty to the point where two people left, um, like the, the people involved in trying to push that story were gone. Not that long after they, they quit and, um, went to Ziff and they went and, and did one up stuff. They started one up, I guess. Um, and it was a really, it was just a weird it was a very fucking strange situation and and I just kind of tried to keep my head down on it because I had a lot of game reviews that I was focused on and, and whatever else but like I had people coming to me and saying like basically saying here's what's happening um and and here's you know like like basically here, here's what's happening around this story and I had read the story at that point I'd read the story that they wanted to run and and I think I had some of the same questions about like this what you mean? You better make sure we're fucking super fucking right about this. Because if we're not, like, what the, f you know, what the hell is this? This is too crazy. Um, and, uh, 
I don't know. So all that went down and that was, you know, that was well before the Dreamcast actually got canceled. And then, so when the, when the Dreamcast stuff happened, there was already, obviously, you know, it, you didn't, it, it didn't take, um, a genius to see that the Dreamcast was not doing well, you know, um, it was, it was not a shock, right. Uh, in, in that specific way, um, because the Dreamcast was not doing well and, and it was very easy to see that. Um, the, the speed with which when they finally pulled the trigger on it, like I said, you know, I, I've told the story before, but like when they held their morning phone call and got Peter Moore on the phone with, you know, everybody in the press and he basically just read his thing saying like, yeah, we're exiting the hardware business. We're doing, this is, this is it. We're going to, we're putting these games out third party. We're going to, which it was far enough removed from that other thing with the acclaim stuff that they didn't even feel connected. So I don't know if there was some deal in place that didn't go through or, you know, whatever the, I don't know what the situation was there. Um, at the end of the day, it's probably for the best for multiple reasons that that story didn't run uh, as it was originally written. Um, but the, it's why it's, it's different from, you know, when we look at where Xbox is right now and when we think about what it was like when Sega got out of the business. Or got out of the got out of the hardware business. Sega was running. They were they were running to stay alive. They were they it felt like they were on the verge of being done. You know, the, with the the urgency with which they suddenly started moving on this shit. How quickly it became like, all right, here's what's going to happen to the Dreamcast. It's, I mean, it'll be on shelves for a little bit, but we're done. The, these games are going to be the last ones. We're gonna we're we're making this happen. Like, yeah, like we, we know what our, we know what we sold this Christmas and we're, 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 we're fucked. We're done. The Dreamcast is done. Um, it felt very abrupt though, you know, for as much as it didn't seem like a surprise, it still did feel abrupt. The next thing that would feel abrupt like that, it was in a different way. It was the original Xbox, the original Xbox to the Xbox 360 that also felt abrupt in a weird way of like Microsoft cutting and running on the first Xbox so that they could have the next generation hardware out faster. That transition felt very bang, bang, bang. It felt very much like, Hey man, yeah, we're all about the Xbox to, yeah, we're not making any more games for that fucking thing. Anyway, over here, shiny new thing, gamer score, you know, uh, like, like that, there was a time where you felt the Xbox had had all of the wind sucked out of it, not just by the marketplace, but by Microsoft realizing that like, okay, this, this console is not our future. It is not our near term future. We have got to move. We've got to make moves right now. We can catch Sony off guard if we move like this right now. And they did. It was, you know, they did. They fucking nailed it. They fucking nailed it. Um, But that felt very, that, that's one of those things where you like look at retail and you're like, suddenly a whole shelf is gone and you're like, what the fuck just happened? Uh, what, they used to sell Xboxes here and they're like, yeah, Microsoft isn't, they just stopped sending them to us. <laughs> we don't know what's up. And then suddenly the 360 was, you know, uh, getting announced and MTV and this and that, and they were off to the races. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think this Xbox stuff is is interesting and potentially very exciting. I think when you if, you know if you remove the the kind of the history, the historical aspect of Microsoft being a player in the hardware space and 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 blah blah blah, which I again from what I was talking about, I, I think there's a way forward for them in hardware. I don't I don't necessarily think that. Uh, I, I don't think there's a version of this where they completely get out of hardware. I don't think that makes sense personally. And, and also I think that because there's so much, they make too much money on Xbox live gold. Still, they make too much money on their subscription services to not have a platform for those. It would be foolish for them to cut and run on that aspect of their business. You know, um, at least I think it, I think it is. I don't know. Like maybe the numbers have changed, but I, you know, like that just seemed like something that they were just making a ton of fucking thing. But I, I, again, I, I do think that there's something to this. I'm going to guess it's on the smaller side of it. Uh, it's on the, the, Hey, uh, we're going to test the waters. We're going to put sea of thieves out on these other platforms and, and see where it goes from there. But, I, but again, like, I think, 
I don't think there are a lot of reasons not to, especially in a world where they can say, well, if you want to get all these games on Game Pass, just come over here. If you want to spend $70 for these games, feel free to buy them on PlayStation, I guess. <clears throat> um, but yeah, I, I don't know. That's a, it's a weird, it's a weird set of stories. I don't know. But there's, they have profiles and gamer points and all, the, like all of these systems in place that have lasted them for all these generations that I think if they were to just blow them away and say, well, the Xbox brand is dead and now Microsoft Game Studios is back and we're putting out games on the PC and on the PlayStation and on this, I, that feels like, um, too much. I feel like that would be them going too far. So I, I think that, I, I don't think they would, I don't think they would do that. And I think in order for them to not do that, I think that there, it makes sense for them to have some version of a box that you put under a TV, even if it's not something that bazillions of people are buying compared to the latest PlayStation. I still think that there's a, a reason and a, a path forward for them to do Xbox hardware, even if they did decide they wanted to put everything out everywhere. Which again, just a rumor. And a wide swath of rumors uh, in, in a lot of different uh, areas of the story, right? So <clears throat> all of that is a very long-winded way of saying, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> uh, <sighs> Other stories, Apple has confirmed the release date for the Apple Vision Pro. This is their AR headset. Uh, it will be out February 2nd. Pre-orders will open on January 19th. And it is, uh, what that thing is $3,500. I had to look it up again because it seems like such a insane amount of money. Um, Tim Cook quoted as saying the era of spatial computing is here. Or, I'm sorry. The era of spatial computing has arrived is the quote. Sorry. Uh, Apple Vision Pro is the most advanced consumer electronics device ever created. Its revolutionary and magic user interface will redefine how we connect, create, and explore. Um, I feel like they have really, really shit the bed when it comes to producing content. When it, when it comes to selling this thing, when it comes to to coming up with a variety of use cases and ways in which you might use this device. I think they have done a really poor job of it. Um, because all they ever show is a very iOS looking interface and people doing like looking at a web browser that's floating in front of them and it's a hundred feet tall or, you know, or whatever, or watching a video or looking at 3d photos like uh, that's a lot of money to spend for that. Um, and even then they're like, and also, you know, when you, when you dig into it, it's like, it'll also support hundreds of iOS apps. And also it will support, uh, a lot of games that are on Apple arcade. You're like, yeah, okay. But they will be flat in a window in front of me. Who fucking cares? That's not who wants to fucking do that. Um, it's insane. Now, Apple has always been averse to really presenting games uh, as a first and foremost uh, pillar of of their hardware, right? As, as something that, like, hey, get it and play some games. What the Golf will be coming to the Apple Vision Pro. There's, there was a press release that hit about that. And so there will be some VR games. I mean, it, it, there are no controllers for this. Uh, you can tether a, you know, you can tether a PlayStation controller, like a whatever, a Bluetooth controller to to it like you can with your phones and whatever else. So like you can use that to play some of these other games, but when it comes to VR style games and, and like those types of spatial experiences, I, you know, the hands-free stuff, the, the, the quest headsets have had a hands-free beta and some of the other stuff for a while now. And, um, when it works, it's okay. And then sometimes it just kind of doesn't work all that well. Uh, one would presume that this works better. Otherwise they wouldn't 
they would not go all in on it as an interface, but will it be good enough tracking of your hands to make for fast motion video games and, and, and all of the sorts of things you would need to do in order to make this work as a game device, as a, as a proper VR headset, I suppose I could say. Um, that's a big if. They also haven't really gotten too into the catalog and too into the lineup of what will run on it and who will be shipping on it. There's, you know, like I said, what the golf made their announcement and I assume there are some others, but it's a, um, I, I, for a device that they're charging this much money for, I feel like they should be going overboard in terms of telling the story about how you would use it. And instead they're, you know, like, and, and it sounds very nice for the sort of things that you, you can't, you know, like it's probably best in class for some of those things of like, do you want to watch a video? Well, we've got over 4k resolution for each eye and these are good HDR screens and, and so on and so forth. And you'll use eye tracking to control the UI and interface, which makes sense when you're navigating an interface in front of you, but makes less sense in a video game context. Um, that's, that's kind of my, I, there are so many question marks around this thing in terms of what it will actually do. Right. Um, because what it will actually do that, that makes it worth you strapping a thing to your head that has a battery life of like two hours, two and a half. If you're watching videos, they updated their uh, page to, to let you know that if you're just watching videos, the battery lasts a little bit longer. Don't watch heat. You'll need to charge the battery halfway through. Of course, you can just leave it plugged in. It does have a, like a, you know, a cable comes out of the headset and goes to a, like a, a pack on your, you know, waist or wherever you put the pack, throw it on a desk, you know, um, and you can, you can plug it in and, and you can plug it in. Um, but again, there's, there's just a, uh, a real lack of real information about what you're going to, what you're going to do with this that makes, that makes it make sense, you know, because I don't think that these experiences that they're showing the idea of like, Oh, it's like a, it's a touch interface or it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it, like an iOS style interface that you control with your eyes and you can make a web browser appear in front of you and you can make uh, your photos and you can take spatial videos on an iPhone and watch them back on the headset and they'll be all around you. And you're like, I, okay. I don't, what problem is this solving? Do people hate monitors? Is this, a th what is the, the, the is, is this, is this just them trying to enter a, is this just them trying to enter the enterprise space, but they can't just come out and say that they have to ship it as a consumer device. Like what Monitors are pretty good and they're not, you know, I have three monitors here in front of me that I paid less than $3,500 for all total and they're great. Um, if it's something that works like the hollow lens and it's like aircraft mechanics are going to wear these and then it'll show them where the parts that they need to move is and blah, blah, blah. Like, okay, I get it. Like from an enterprise perspective, I get it. Like, you know, okay. They're like the HoloLens is out there doing that stuff too. Um, and the, the enterprise uses for VR and AR and all of that sort of stuff. I get it. Like that, that's a totally, like, I'm not talking about that. Like, I'm sure that there's some way forward for the vision pro as an enterprise class device that gets used for that sort of shit. But that's not Apple. That's not the thing that they, that they really do. Um, they're trying to make big mass market weird device. The iPhone is, is, is the iPhone's quite good. It's boring. And so I, I think that's, that's kind of like when we look at AI and we look at VR and we look at AR, we look at Apple specifically trying to charge this amount of money for this thing. Um, all of it, I, I keep coming back to the fact that like existing technology is boring and it has been for a long time. Phones, phones used to feel cool, man. 
and and the upgrades from not necessarily year to year but maybe every couple of years felt dramatic and they don't anymore you know the you know what an iphone does you know what an android phone does you know they can sit there and try to be like well this one folds and you're like i who cares <laughs> who fucking cares um it's still the same thing it's still the same touch interface it's still the same shit but like yeah going from the iPhone 3G to the iPhone 4, or from the first iPhone to the second iPhone, when they said, oh, oh, you're right, we do need an app store. We should have an app store. Changed the world. For, for better and for worse, it changed the world. The iPhone's amazing. Um, it, you know, and I, I was resistant to it at first because I didn't, I didn't want to give up a keyboard. Um, I had my, my T-Mobile sidekick, my Danger Hip Top. I had bought all four of those that they put out uh, and and loved having that device that had a web browser that had this. So it's like, I was already like the, the, the idea of the mobile web, the idea of accessing the internet on your phone and, and AOL instant messenger on my phone and all of that sort of shit. Um, like it, 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 that all made sense. It was just the keyboard thing that when the iPhone first came out, I was like, that's, that's really neat, but I, I don't know. I kind of like a keyboard, especially because I'm typing in the dark at a press conference and I need to look at the screen uh, of the press conference while I'm typing and, and can't look you know down to use a touch screen. It made a lot of sense, uh, but the iPhone was too good. And it made sense to go get them. And so we all went and got iPhones on the same day. And, and that was, that was that. I don't know. Hell of a device. Hell of a device. They get better every year, but like, now I just buy them because the cameras got better and I buy them every two or three years and I go like, oh yeah. And if I didn't have kids, uh, I would probably not have bought a new iPhone in the last, or I would have so much extra money from not having kids that I would be buying all the iPhones because who cares? Um, but, uh, the primary driver of me upgrading to a new phone is, well, I'm taking a lot of pictures of these kids. What if the pictures were better? And that's it. That's really the only thing. Cause the rest of it's fucking identical. You know, like it's a little faster. Yeah. The screen's better. Like, you know, it, it's, it's, but the, the experience, the, what does it do for me in my life? That's not changing. And so, uh, phones are boring and they have been for a very long time. And I think with that technology has been kind of boring. There's still a lot of stuff that's exciting, you know, like I, OLED screen technology and like, you know, in, in a very kind of niche way, some of that stuff is really great. Uh, I love this monitor that I bought last year. It's great. It's great. But in terms of the paradigm shift, in terms of the like, here's a device that's going to change the way you think about the world and you know, like, and I, that, I, that's why they're so desperately trying to get into AI and trying to get into all of this stuff, right? It's because they think that that's going to be the next big shift. And mm, I don't know. When Microsoft says we're going to add a key to keyboards and when you push it, it activates Microsoft Copilot. I, I don't want to do that. I, like I said, I use the group policy editor to disable Copilot because I just don't need it. Uh, if it gets dramatically better, then yeah, I'll certainly try it. But I, I don't, it's not useful, but you know, I, I know how to, but also it's not useful because it can't interface with my actual PC. If I could say, Hey, uninstall Microsoft copilot, it should just respond with, okay, cool. Doing it. Are you sure? And yeah, instead it goes and fucking Googles it for you. No, I'm sorry. It bings it for you and then comes back with a summary of what it found. You're like, motherfucker. Like. You're the PC. You should be doing shit. If I say, you know, hey, man, uh, open my email and do this and send this email to this person and do like it should do a lot of that stuff. Uh, and it's in a preview phase, so presumably it will, you know, that's the stuff when they talk about integrating it more deeply into PCs. I assume that that's what they're getting at, right? But launching it in a state like this where it's like, here's an AI that can Google shit for you. Okay, I guess I guess Siri doesn't Siri can't really look stuff up all that well, so I guess that's a step forward. 
whatever. It, it's it's real weird. It's real weird. Um, the Apple Vision Pro is something I would like to try, but at the same time, I I don't. It, it's it's really it, it's that curiosity is born out of this notion of just like I don't know what the fuck you do with it because I don't want to. I don't want to sit down and go, all right, let's put this on so that I can browse the web. Like, I don't want to, that's not, I've got my phone for that. I've got this computer in front of me for that. Most people would probably have their phone for that. Do they need to put it on so that they can look at it bigger? I don't, I, I don't, what's the, what's the benefit to me and my life? What is going to, what is about this is making my life better? That it's like, a, oh, I, I gotta, I gotta get in on this AI stuff. What, what about it is actually better? That's my big problem with, with all of this stuff. Um, so I, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't, I don't like being in the position of like shitting on new technology. Cause I, I know that like, that's like all, all everything starts somewhere everything starts small and 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 when you do have these big explosions of innovation they're then followed by the kind of significantly less sexy decade of refinements upon that idea like that's what phones were and that's what vr is right i mean when the rift came out suddenly it was like holy sh it was like oh my god we got all, you know this is this is incredible and then you realize like, oh, but it's not that incredible. Oh, and it's like, yeah, I guess it's advancing, but not, hmm, hmm. This has some problems. And those problems are not interesting because then you're like, okay, well now, you know, it's going to take another decade or more for this stuff to become better to the point where you might recommend it. And some people will probably still get very sick. That's kind of the cool thing about the Steam Deck and that 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 class of device is that you immediately understand it right now. You get it. You're like, oh yeah, cool. Like this this plays games better than I thought it would for a device this small, and it's very portable. And you see clear spots where it could improve in terms of battery life. And of course, if we're talking about a PC gaming device, there's the never ending treadmill of fucking hardware upgrades that you could do. But, uh, as a first gen steam deck, like I, I've probably put, I've already put more hours onto a steam deck than I probably have, you know, uh, in VR over the last decade. And like, I, I did what, what's at the time seemed like a lot of VR shit for a lot of years there when this stuff was getting off the ground. Like I was, I was the guy trying out every single thing that was coming out on steam for a while. there, desperately looking for something that was interesting and different. And so rarely finding it. Um, Nvidia has announced another set of graphics cards. They're slightly better and slightly less expensive. I don't know. There's the. Oh, let's see. Here's the Video Games Chronicles recap of this is. Uh, the 4080 Super. The 4070 Super. And the 4070 Ti Super. Which I. I think putting T have they done this before? Have they used both TI and super on the same device? I know they've had super cards before. I know they've had TI cards before, but something about them calling a thing, the 4070 TI super is, uh, fucking ridiculous. Fucking ridiculous. Um, 4070 Super has 20% more cores than the 4070, and it will be $600. Um, this will make it, uh, the, according to the quote here, faster than the 3090 at a fraction of the power. The 4070 Ti Super will be $799. It'll be available on January 24th. More cores than a 4070 Ti. Increased frame buffer. 256-bit memory bus. 
that apparently breaks down to, well, they keep comparing it to the previous generations of cards, which is not, okay, sure, if you're looking to upgrade, that's meaningful. Um, but I guess, yeah, no, yeah, I guess the, the comparison makes sense because you would have to be really fucking broken inside to already have a 40 series card and then be upgrading to a different 40 series card. Uh, as someone who is broken inside, let me tell you. Uh, th so they say that it's 1.6 times faster than a 3070 Ti. On January 31st, the 4080 Super will come out for $999. It is 1.4 times faster than a 3080 Ti without frame generation, but it's twice as fast with it. Uh, this uh, and, and, and VGC points out that this replaces the stock 4080, which was $200 more expensive than this when it came out uh, back in late 2022. No upgrade for 4090 owners. No 4090 super. What the fuck, man? I'm just supposed to sit here with this 4090 and just sit on my hands and not upgrade? Weak. Um. Yeah, where's a 4090 Ti Super? You're gonna need. Look, you're gonna need these upgrades when you think about. Uh, I mean, you know, Horizon Forbidden West is gonna have DLSS three in it. You're gonna you're gonna want to use that, but you're gonna need these upgrades when you start looking at all these fucking monitors that just got announced. Maybe not. Maybe not. I don't know. The CES news is kind of all over the place. There's not a ton of interesting things. I watched the Sony keynote last night, um, which is kind of I I I've watched it for the past few years now because it's it's just I don't know it's it's I realize that it's on and I'm I just happen to have time at that time. I'm like all right. Um, I gotta say, if you want to experience the dumbest, the dumbest live stream chat imaginable if you want to see the saddest motherfuckers go to the YouTube live chat of the Sony's CES keynote because all the people there are video game fans and they are watching a live stream from Sony the corporation that does a lot more than video games. And they're just in there typing GTA 6 over and over again. And saying that the Xbox is garbage. It's fucking wild. Like I was just sitting here. I'm, I'm staring at it. And, and I'm staring at this chat. Just going like man. I feel like. It, it made me feel like. Um, embarrassed isn't the word like but but it, i just i felt uh, like watching it i felt bad about myself in a way of just like man i like video games fuck it sure is a shame that so many of the people that like video games that are on the internet are fucking garbage <laughs> um and so i don't know there there was not a lot they, they had a car uh, the Sony Honda Mobility um, has a, a, an electric car called the Afila that will be added to Gran Turismo 7 this year. And uh, the car has support for the Unreal Engine. And so they showed the inside of the car and they showed a bunch of Fortnite graphics on the dashboard and stuff. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> what is this insane bullshit? Um... um And uh, the guy, the guy who is responsible for the Afila project, drove the car onto stage, onto the stage with a PlayStation Five controller. Though the Verge is reporting uh, that that maybe that was fake because the guy says I stared at that guy's thumbs and they were not moving. So maybe he didn't really drive the car onto the stage with a PlayStation Five controller after all. Um. You know, there's a gravity rush uh, uh, 
movie or you know something coming uh, they, they said that they were going to make a god of war tv show you know like a few little things like that um but not no not not a big game show not there to really talk about games uh in a in a major way so um the car was probably the the biggest silliest thing there um like I said, MSI has announced a, a handheld PC. They're calling it the Claw. Um, looks to be about on par with some of the other devices in that category. Both LG and Samsung have transparent TVs. Like just a pane of glass that you can look through and it'll put television on it. And if you want it to look like a real TV, there's a thing you can buy. Well, I imagine it's motorized, but you can pull up a a black sheet of paper or something behind it, roll it up behind it. So it looks something closer to a regular television. It looks neat. You look at it. I mean, I'm, you know, you only look at it through video. I'm sure in person, it probably looks fucking crazy. Um, but it sounds like that LG is going to sell a transparent TV this year. They did not announce pricing or anything like that, but they, they are committing to putting that thing out this year. That would be neat. I don't know. Um, a lot of monitors getting announced that have quite frankly, ridiculous refresh rates on it. I have a 240 Hertz monitor here in front of me, this LG OLED that I bought. It's been a great monitor. Um, it's been a fantastic monitor for me and I don't think I'm going to upgrade to any of these, but these, it, it, it's, it sounds like that we're going to get a lot more competition in the OLED monitor space, which is great. OLED HDR monitors, they they look fucking fantastic. As, as a proponent of these LG TVs for the past handful of years here, uh, having it on a device that I actually play games on uh, is great. <laughs> fantastic. Uh, and so Asus has a 27-inch uh, monitor that does 1440p at 480 hertz. 480 that's a uh that's that is an illegal number of of frames i uh i don't even know what i mean you know i can't even hit 240 on most games and i have a 4090 in this machine um so i don't know what i don't i don't know what you're going to do with that lg and asus have 4k monitors as well that will do 4K 240 hertz or 1080 at 480 hertz. And there's a variety of 1440p OLEDs from like Dell and MSI that will do 360 hertz. Um, I love it. Give me all the frames. Now make games that are optimized well enough to take advantage of this amazing technology without having to use frame generation because that induces latency. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's, 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 it's anyway, like I said, as, as someone who's had an OLED monitor now for a while, I got to say, uh, having more competition in this space and more variety in this space is awesome. Um, windows 11 has been really good with its HDR stuff. The auto HDR stuff that it does to games that don't directly support HDR is taken straight from the Xbox. And that stuff has worked quite well in a lot of cases. Um, it's been really nice. Not so great if you are streaming because streaming technology is not at a point where, you know, HDR and and uh, all of those high frame rates or anything necessarily translate. And so that can, you know, that can cause some some issues here and there. Um, also, some really gigantic televisions are getting announced. I feel like that's always the CES story is someone's making a bigger TV. TCL I, I have to like I have to stop and work hard in my brain to not just call it tickle for whatever reason uh announced a 115 inch television see I, I all these big TVs are getting announced I'm I feel like I'm the only guy over here that's sitting here thinking that I want a smaller TV like if I if I were to ever replace this LG well I'd probably go get another LG but I know they make ones that are like 42 inch or something like that. Like I would probably go down in size, 
so that I could have it closer and integrate it with this setup more readily as opposed to having it all the way over there, got to turn all the way over there, like something that could be part of this, like a, a, an L-shaped desk. Like if I could just have a 42 or, or whatever right here next to me or something and play console games that way, that'd be fucking badass. That would be my next move on the... If I were to buy another television, it would be specifically a, a smaller one to put on a desk for console games. Um... But yeah, the the idea of a 115 inch television, like I don't, why are we, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? When we could all just be wearing Apple Vision Pros and to get a, a, a television that big, we're just saying when the earthquakes come, a 115 inch television is going to hurt when it fucking falls off your wall onto your fucking face. That's all. Um, when it comes to live streaming at those frame rates, maybe we will hit them someday. Most of you, oh, uh, the chrononaut here says most of us don't live where the earthquakes. Yeah, you will. Oh, you will. When the earthquakes come, they're not going to stop. You ever see Thundar the Barbarian? It's going to be like that. Um, <sighs> streaming technology has been um, kind of stuck in time for years now uh, Twitch is going to go in beta for some upgrades to their broadcasting experience that I have somewhat mixed thoughts on but basically they are calling it enhanced broadcasting with multiple encodes and they are they are looking to take signups for people that want to join a beta uh that will in result in you getting a beta version of OBS that has some Twitch specific uh submissions to it uh and Basically, what this revolves around is what is known as transcodes. So when you watch a stream on Twitch, um, sometimes that stream can be viewed at different qualities. This stream should be able to, as I am a partnered stream, uh, you should be able to watch this in, in three or four different qualities. That is something that they say is only available to partners and for you know affiliates when it's available or whatever because it's something that they have to have computational power on their side to handle and so as a result i don't have to worry about it i send the best thing i can send knowing that twitch will break it up into four different things and that people will be able to view it most people streaming to twitch uh the viewing experience is you're watching exactly what the streamer is sending, the same bit rate, the same quality, all of that other stuff. Twitch does not transcode that stream in any way. So if you're somewhere, if they're streaming hot, if they're streaming high bit rate and you don't can't watch it, it will stutter and, and sputter and, and not be a good experience. Now, in my mind, the solution to that problem is for Twitch to spend the money to throw more computers at the problem. And also to upgrade the technology in ways that help that become a little bit more efficient and so on and so forth. But they are approaching it from a different way where instead they will allow you to do the multiple encodes yourself. So if you want to encode four different versions of your stream and send it to them four different times then your stream will have transcodes. Now, that, even, even if you're not a partner, you will theoretically be able to do that. Um, and, and you will be able to kind of send multiple streams to Twitch. That then becomes a more of a burden on the streamer's hardware and bandwidth. Um, but it's an option. Uh, it's cheaper than it's cheaper for Twitch than it is for them to go buy uh, f way more additional server capacity and compute power and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. 
right? Um, and so I think uh, during this beta, they will allow people to send three different encodes to them. Um, and that's not, you know, that, that the idea of sending multiple encodes out is not uh, is not necessarily new. Back in the day, we did that for um, subscriber-focused streams. We would send a high and a low and maybe a middle. I don't know. We were, but, you know, we were basically doing those transcodes to, to send that stuff out. So it's not unheard of. Um, what they say here is transcoding is a problem. Well, they describe transcoding. Um, transcodes are provided to many, but not all Twitch streamers and are generated in Twitch data centers. Multiple encodes are generated directly from your source content in OBS studio and produce multiple video qualities, improving the experience for viewers. Um, they're also rolling out some changes to OBS or, you know, like the, that will basically, there's a lot of, there's a, OBS is a very powerful piece of software. It, it, it allows you full control over the encoders, uh, whatever you need to do. If you have a long, crazy command line, you need to feed it because you need it to be this exact way. Generally speaking, you can do that. Um, but it gets out there and you find people that are spending time like, just like, okay, I need this bit rate and this, you know, they become wizards of these FFmpeg command command lines, and as they try to fine tune the image quality and the the frame rate and everything to their liking. If this other thing that Twitch is working on works, that will be a thing of the past. They are calling it automatic stream configuration. When you basically when you push the go button to start a stream, a server side algorithm returns the best possible configuration for OBS Studio. That optimizes the viewer experience, giving constraints in your setup. We plan to use automatic stream configuration to experiment with higher bit rates, 1440p 60 and 4K 60 streaming, and new codecs in the future. Those new codecs are HEVC and AV1. So right now, if you are using that beta, or if you if you get into this beta when they start it, they want everyone to have an NVIDIA card because they're going to be, that's all they're going to support at first probably with the version of OBS that they're they're working on but other cards that have hardware encoders for AV1 do exist and so that takes a lot of the load off of your computer when it comes to processing the stream right now i am actually so i send one stream i'm i'm doing two streams right now i send one to i send one to twitch which is within their confines of their limits and then my local recording is better quality compressed with AV1. And AV1 is a much more modern and efficient codec for compression. Uh, these these NVIDIA cards have hardware encoders for AV1 on them, so it is relatively trivial for me to do that. Um, and so, and, and YouTube can accept AV1 codec uploads. Some other, most other places cannot. So like the Patreon video player, for example, uh, does not want 265. It will only take the bone stock H264 version of an upload and, and, and all of that. And then they'll process it and roll it around for a long time. And then it'll come out the other end. Um, but yeah, a AV1 is not something that is, you know, like YouTube added the ability to stream in AV1 relatively recently. Um... I went to go try it and could not get it to work properly, but I, I didn't spend a ton of time messing with it. Uh, they have not started the beta just yet, but it is something that they are looking at doing in the future. Um, and I'm kind of looking through their Q&A right now to see if there's anything else. It's using enhanced RTMP, which is an enhanced version of the standard RTMP protocol. Um... AV1, yeah, uh, the question in the chat is, isn't it in their best interest to do AV1 since the overall file sizes are smaller? So, yes and no. When they get an AV1 file, they can't just serve that to everybody because not everyone is on a device that can play back AV1 files. Um, and so they still have to transcode it and store it in a wide variety of formats. Me recording an AV1 locally is great for my local storage because I have local backups of just about everything I've done over the last year or two here. Um, and also it helps me. I can, because it's AV1 and it's a more efficient codec, I can actually throw a higher bit rate at it 
and get better quality than I would otherwise and, and blah, blah, blah. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's still a new codec and th th there's still a lot of stuff. That th this is a welcome change. Twitch has been kind of behind the times on a lot of their bit rate and streaming options for, for a bit now. Uh, and YouTube added the AV1 stuff relatively recently. And so that was a situation where it's like, oh man, okay, shit. Um, and so this is a way for them to catch up. This is also a way for if you want, if you want transcodes and you have the hardware on your end, but you're not a partner, you'll still be able to generate them for your viewers, which is, which is nice. I just, I, I hope that Twitch also decides to increase their server capabilities and, and all of, but uh, you know, I guess, you know, when you talk to the, about the affiliate experience, um, it sounds like a lot of affiliates usually get, so it, it becomes like, uh, you know, they, they try to guarantee it for partners. If you're a Twitch affiliate, you, they don't guarantee it, but you probably get it more often than not, unless there's just a lot of people streaming at that time and the, the servers are all in use and then you might not get one. Um, I think everyone should get one. I think everyone should get transcoding. They should, they should support their entire user base because that's like, if, sometimes you just, you tune into a stream and you can't watch it because like they're streaming something to, I mean, I, I don't have that problem, but you know, if, if I was on a phone or if I was in Australia or if I was in Australia on a phone, then Hey, um, anyway, it's, uh, I, I, I'm excited that they're as, as some, like half the reason I bought a 4090 was because of the AV one encoding stuff and, and the ability to, to do that, that level of encoding. So if Twitch can accept that in the relatively near future, um, that's super exciting. Uh, it, it's a, it seems like a hell of a codec so far. I want more hardware support for devices to be able to play it back natively. That's been a big uh, uh, comment. That's been a big complaint. That's been a big topic in the Plex community lately when it comes to files that can be direct played on a Roku or an Amazon Fire Stick or all of this other shit. Nothing, nothing can play back AV1 natively. And so the Plex server has to transcode it into 264 which is then costly on the server side um, because it has to spin up and, and do the encoding and, and, and all of that. Um, native playback of AV1 on every device. We won't be happy until it's there. Um... Let's see. So yeah, that that's coming to Twitch in the relatively near future. Um, but they are not going to add support. It, okay, so, so one of the questions in the fact here is um, will enhanced broadcasting also support HDR streams or higher frame rates? We are not currently planning to support HDR 10-bit video or frame rates higher than 60 frames per second, but may explore this in the future. So, they're not going all the way. But this at least, like, starts them down a path to where they could get to that point if they wanted to. Um, when Which channels will get AV1 and who can watch it? When will new codecs be supported? Codecs like, uh, this is, I, I actually, I want to know this. Uh, codecs like AVC and HEVC have taken many years to roll out, primarily limited by efficient consumer playback support. And it's still early days for AV1. This technology makes it possible for us to safely experiment with HEVC and AV1 encoding, but it's still too early to say which creators will get assigned HEVC or AV1 encoding or how fast it will be deployed. Joining the beta program gives you a chance to be among the first live streams in history that use AV1 encoding. On Twitch. It's, it's, they should have... Oh well. Um, anyway, that, that's a cool change. It's, uh, like I said, there's something that kind of sticks... It sticks in my craw a little bit. The idea that they're offloading the transcoding burden onto you. Partners will still get it and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's not, you know, um, but it always just felt like something that like, oh, Twitch needs to spend the money and step up their, 
you know, they, they need to increase their, uh, server capacity, their computing power, their ability to transcode streams and, and so on and so forth. But, um, instead they're doing it in this way, which I imagine is far less expensive for them to do. Uh, let's see, there's a, a kind of a weird, kind of a weird lot of news here. Um, this week I see yes happened. So I guess there's that stuff in addition to kind of the, the boilerplate stuff. Um, unity is going to do some more layoffs. They, uh, are going to cut 1800 people. That is around 25% of their, uh, overall, uh, employment, I, I guess. Um, <clears throat> This is uh, part of their efforts to refocus the company on their kind of core offerings. Um, you know, obviously, Riccatello, the former CEO of the company, was out back in October. If you remember, they had the whole uh, kerfuffle, it's a nice way of putting it, uh, over the idea of charging developers on a per install basis to use the Unity engine. Um, which was not, not a well-received change. And so now, uh, they are, yeah, this is, uh, they framed it as a company reset, uh, video games, chronicle.com is a good recap of all this stuff. Um, and so they, yeah, they, they walked back a lot of those changes and, and now it sounds like that they're, you know, they, they're focusing on the core parts of their business. They, that, that's. Cause like they bought like Weta digital, like they, they, they tried to, they went and they chased some waterfalls over there at unity and then suddenly realized that they needed more money coming in to pay for it and then had to find that money. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Like you, you, it's the the problem with these sorts of gambles is like it, it makes sense in a way that like oh yeah you we're an engine company and obviously Unreal is starting to see more and more uptake in the uh, the visual effects business in film and television and so of course Unity would want to be in that space as well and so okay it makes sense for them and we're gonna buy Weta Digital and then we'll have a another foothold in that space and we'll be able to grow from there and like you understand why those things might happen um but then it kind of gets destroyed as a part of all this process like the the problem with these sorts of bets like you know companies place bets all the time right they they go like oh we're gonna we're gonna bet on this company we're gonna buy this company we're gonna bring them in we're gonna bet on th this is the course of action we're taking the leadership of the company has gotten together we've stared at spreadsheets for like a fucking week and this is the direction we're going in this is the bet we're placing and not all the bets pay off, right? They're not, no one's always right. If they were, the stock market would be a very boring place. Um, but ultimately the problem is like the people that decide to place those bets, the CEOs of the world, they get golden parachuted out. They're like, oh, well, I guess, I guess my bet didn't pay off and they fired me. I guess they pushed me out. Good thing I got paid millions of dollars to no longer work there. I guess I'm slightly disgraced, but I'll still be able to find another job because I'm John Riccatello. Oh, whatever. Um, they never, the, 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 they don't suffer the same way that these 1800, 1800 people will when they lose their job on top of the other 260 ish people that got cut a while ago. Um, you know, the disgrace has to be severe for it to have a, a lasting impact on their career. Riccatello will get a job somewhere else. He's, you know, he's not an idiot. You know, like he, he's, a, he's a guy that's made mistakes, but he's also been there at the upswing of a handful of companies as well. He's gotten some of the guesses right, I guess. Um, Bobby Kotick probably made a lot of money on his way out. He probably did just fine. And he can go off and pursue a career in politics or sports or, you know, whatever weird, whatever disaster he decides to 
get into. Um, but the people that pay the price are always the people that are, you know, like working their jobs and getting laid off and getting fucked in the process. Uh, and that sucks. I don't know. I, I like, I don't know. That's at some point that's capitalism. I was going to say like, there's gotta be a way to make sure that the, the, the bets are, are more directly impacting the people that are taking these people's jobs into, you know, and putting them in, in peril, uh, with all of their over expansion, all of the other fucking bullshit that happened. But well, that'll never happen. Let's face it. I mean, you could unionize, but even that's only going to take you so far. If the company's failing, your union is can only do so much. They'll ensure that you get treated fairly on your way out, a little more fairly than you would otherwise. Unions are good. But if the company is fucked, the company is fucked. Quick story here from Kotaku about the Def Jam games and why there has not been another one. This is really just a couple of tweets from Ice-T. Um, I guess some footage of the game has gone viral recent, recently, which is hilarious to me. The, the Def Jam fight for New York, like those games. Um, people always want more of those. Uh, and, but, you know, Ice-T kind of puts it plain. He says, so many people ask me why this game hasn't been brought back for the newer consoles. Maybe because they'd have to pay for voice and music rights again. Maybe. And then he says, here's the big problem. I don't think they paid anything any of us anything to be in that original game. I know I didn't get any type of substantial money. It was a situation where you didn't want to be left out of the game. Well, yesterday's price is not today's price. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it would probably cost a lot of money to make that, to pay all the talent to be in it, and uh, that's certainly a factor. Um, I think if they were to make a new one of those, I don't think that they would just put the same people in it again. Um, I think if they were going to, if they were going to make a new Def Jam game, I don't necessarily think that you have to go get ice tea. I think you would go get people that were maybe a little more relevant in today's hip hop scene, which I think is far less interesting, <laughs> but, um, and maybe ice tea makes that cut anyway. Right. I mean, sure. Maybe, you know, but like, I don't, yeah, I don't know what, I don't want to go down this road because it's, it's not a, it's not actually a fun, once we get into it, it's not that fun of a conversation, but like, I, would you put Def, if you were to make a new game in the vein of Def Jam fight for New York and to put rappers in it, would today's rappers make sense in a, in that context? Of like, we're on the streets fighting each other and hip hop. Like, is that? No. No. <laughs> Pat Bear says it would, it would 100% wouldn't be a fighting game. It would be a Fortnite knockoff. Sure. Yeah. And different rappers have different vibes, right? You know, you could, uh, yeah. Yes. Put the Griselda guys into the AEW game. Yeah. Why not? They deserve to be in a better game than that, but hey, uh, put Drake in Fortnite. Yes, put Drake in Fortnite. At this point, at this point, Drake is the Fortnite of rap. That's unfair to Fortnite. I don't mean that to sound. I don't mean that to be sound as negative to Fortnite as it comes across. Pay an extra $10 and you get your Anita Max Win hat. And back bling. Um, Jack Harlow. Fuck. Fuck Jack Harlow. Whack shit. Fucking terrible. Have you heard the new Jack Harlow joint? Like, fuck you. What? The fuck away from me. <laughs> um, anyway, that's it for the news. Uh, let's get into a few emails. 
podcast at guard.bike is the email address. I, you know, I, I, uh, I, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of new hip hop that I am okay with, but it's, it's all stuff that like, I'm at a point now where stuff just kind of comes on on Spotify and I'm just like listening to shit and I don't catch what it is some of the time, but like uh, sometimes I come across stuff and I'm like, yeah, this is all right. But I don't always go back to, to listen to it, but I feel like I heard Jack Harlow's name enough times that I was like, well, what the fuck is Jack Harlow all about? And went and listened to some of it. I was like, fuck this. What the fuck is, fuck you. Come on. Maybe that's an old man ass opinion and fine, whatever. But I, I, Jesus Christ. Is, if that's something that is popular, then, then clearly something still works in the, like people talk about how all oh, the music industry is for getting fucking blown the fuck out and they don't know how to, uh, move an artist anymore. They, they're, you know, like everyone, the independent viral TikTok artists and, and all this sort of stuff. Like the idea that like anyone knows what the fuck Jack Harlow's name is clearly means that the music industry is capable of fucking shipping some fucking wick prick platinum here and there. Right. Um, let's see here. Let's look at your emails. Podcast at guard dot bike is the email address. Johnny from Austin, Texas writes in, um, it says, as much as you discussed the gaming media, I can't recall you saying much about amateur fan sites. I volunteered at a major fan site for 15 years back in the late 90s through the early 2000s. It seemed that the biggest fan sites were competing directly with professional uh, outlets like GameSpot, IGN, 1UP, etc. and saw comparable traffic. At times, some fan sites had access parity for media events and publisher resources, broke news stories that the pros then sourced, or saw original content go viral. They had detailed editorial policies and processes, sophisticated content management systems, and correspondence around the world. Since fan site staff typically weren't paid, they could have dozens of writers, artists, editors, etc. My site would bring up to 30 people to E3 and spread out to cover a huge breadth. We all paid for ourselves to be there and worked 12 to 16 hour days. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the fan site era. Did you ever patronize any fan sites or view them as your competition? Were they doing anything that you envied or copied or despised? Did you ever hire people from fan sites and how'd that go? Is social media mainly to blame for the diminished relevance of such platforms these days? Um, So yeah, back in that era, there was a lot of fan sites and, and you, I mean, I mean, Destructoid probably kind of started that way, uh, in, in a, in a sense, right. Where they were, I guess, technically more of a business. Maybe that was kind of the end of it is you had, you know, when, when suddenly people were starting businesses that would then kind of exploit writers, uh, like I, I I don't know the so yeah the the fan sites the the of that era were of a different breed than than some of the stuff we're talking about that happened later whether it was a uh, what was the thing what was the thing that Dan Shu did it was like oh six oh seven there was something that he started that was like like he was running it but it was all amateur writers and I don't know that they were bit mob. That's what it was. Bitmob. I'm not sure that those people were ever getting paid or not, or, or what the, what the thing was. Um, nowadays, all writers for all websites get exploited. So it, it's, you know, in some ways the fan sites of the early two thousands were, were kind of pioneering a path forward. Um, so it was never really something that, like the, the the fan site stuff of that era was never something that I really spent any real time thinking about, I guess is, is the, is the actual answer to that question. Um, you would sometimes see some of those folks at events. We hired a couple of people that had experience at sites like that. It was certainly like valid experience in the space and that would cut both ways. Sometimes you would have people that would come in and have like this so you could almost liken this to 
indie wrestlers coming into WWE in a weird way where it's like, yeah, we do things a different way and we do it for a reason. And you're going to have to fucking learn that way because we don't just fucking write shit to write shit. We don't, you know, we make sure that these articles are sourced. Other people look at these and edit them. Like, you know, there was the news stuff in particular. Um, it wasn't really until Kotaku got started that this happened on a more regular basis, but it was something that some of the fan sites would do here and there is they were writing stories based off one source. They were writing rumor articles that, that GameSpot didn't really traffic in. IGN would get into some of that stuff back then, if I remember correctly. But like, generally speaking, if we were writing a story and Tor Thorson got way into this idea of writing stories that were like, it, it was he called it rumor control. And it was something where he would go and th this was kind of a way to address some of this bullshit. Um, because a lot of it was bullshit. You would see articles pop up on fan sites that were just straight up not true. Or like, there's a kernel of truth to it, but the person doesn't have the full story, and so they've written like incredibly incorrect things. And so what Tor would do is he would run those stories down. He would get official comment from companies in some cases, or uh, or, or what have you. And, um, and that generally worked for GameSpot, a site, a, a site the size of GameSpot and IGN could afford to do that. Um, when Kotaku came along and started getting a lot of buzz in, in their rumor stories, because Kotaku was better at being right, Crescente had newspaper experience and was, you know, a, a lot, a much better journalist than I think a lot of people that were associated with kind of fan sites in that era. Um, and so that was the thing that started causing us problems. It was this feeling of like, okay, now we're being scooped on things by like two or three days because we can't run down the official story fast enough. And there's no, like, are we going to start running rumor stories? Yes or no. And there was gigantic pushback on the idea of getting into rumors at all. Um, and so we timidly would, would try to tiptoe into it and try to find different ways to, to make that shit work. But we wanted to have things that were on GameSpot not be bullshit. And there were some people that, you know, some people that came from fan site backgrounds and all the other stuff that were very much against that. They were like, no, we need to get the, you know, like it's not unlike the story from, from back in the day. And one of those, one of the people in that story actually did come from a fan site, actually, now that I think about it. Um, um, not that that, uh, you know, he, he did amazing work and, and continues to do solid work in video games to this day. Uh, the both of them. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. It, it was never a thing. It was like, we got all the traffic reports of like who was doing what traffic wise when it came to, um, you know, whatever the, not, you know, it's, it's the, the real, the real actual numbers, not the, like, let's go look at Alexa and see what bullshit Alexa made up for page rankings these days. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't know that there were fan sites of that era that I would say saw comparable traffic. Uh, I don't remember ever thinking like, oh man, this Nintendo website is really killing it. Or, or I don't remember ever seeing that. Usually it was like, you know, a lot of cases it, it felt like a, um, I, I've said this before, I think last time this topic came up, that you know, the, the people at the fan sites, because they weren't getting paid, uh, because they didn't necessarily have as much money to invest in product if they needed to buy it, they were far more reliant on getting things in the mail. And so that would lead to situations. The the story I always heard was around NVIDIA and around PC fan sites that dared to say an NVIDIA card was not amazing. And this is decades ago. I'm sure none of those people are at NVIDIA anymore. But it was a situation where someone wrote like, ah, this, you know, GeForce 2 or whatever the fuck is not all that or, you know, whichever, I don't know what card it was. Um, and NVIDIA said, well, okay, I'm never going to send you anything ever again uh, because you wrote that. And also kind of this inherent, like kind of minor threat of like, and I, you know, I know, I know a lot of people around this business. I can tell them that you're unprofessional and hard to work with uh, and basically kind of threaten people to change articles and take shit down. Um, and on our end, I, I always, the, the, the approach I always had 
um, was you've got to be prepared to fucking buy every game overnight. If you're just like, hey, if the entire industry wakes up the next day and goes, man, fuck these guys. These assholes are, are ruining our ability to sell games. Like, if we're telling it like it is, if, if we're giving middling reviews to middling games and, and all of that, and the industry gets pissed off at it, good. Good. Make better games. It's easy, right? Just make better games. Simple. Um, and so we had to be in a position to be able to stand behind our writers and be willing to weather that storm and handle that heat of like, okay, all right, if, if this company's never going to send us a game again, we'll just buy them. Fuck it. We'll still cover the games. It'll be a little late, but hey, whatever. Uh, it rarely came to that. Very rarely. But, um, but I think, I think you have to be willing to, to go down that road. Or, or you have to be able to at least consider that possibility because if you're completely beholden to game companies sending you things in the mail, and now there's so much coming out and, and, and you know, at the time we were trying to cover everything, right? So that, that's kind of the rub there. These days, it's just as easy as like, well, they didn't send it, but there's like 20 other games out this week, so we'll just focus on those. It's fine. Um, and no one can, no one has the people to cover everything anyway. Uh, so with limited exception, meaning if it's a first party or it's Rockstar, then you're like, uh, it's a bummer that we have to buy these games and we're not getting them early because IGN is getting it, is getting this coverage up earlier. And then you're like, okay, well, can we find a mom and pop store that is going to break street date so we can get our hands on it just as early or if not earlier than other outlets are getting it? That was always the nasty thing. It's always the fucked up thing uh, is, you know, you'd be beholden to an embargo. Meanwhile, someone up the street is already selling it and there's a bunch, you know, and when YouTube happens and all this other stuff, there's like a bunch of footage of a game online and you're like, fuck, I've got a review ready to go. Can't run it. But people are buying the game. That sucks. Um, but like the, the fan size stuff, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, we certainly hired a few folks that, that had experience in that realm. And, and generally speaking, they came in, you know, with, with a lot of solid skills. Um, but it wasn't, and, and yeah, you, you would know people that, that worked at some of those sites and you see them at events and it was the same as, you know, it wasn't like they were like, oh, those fans I got, you know, you, you, you didn't know who people were writing for half the time anyway. It was just like, oh, hey, Barry's here. What's up, man? And then you're on to the next thing. You're like, what's Barry doing? Is he freelance for USA Today? No, is it a Nintendo site? Oh, whatever. All right, whatever. Um, so... So yeah, I don't know, at, at events and, and whatever else, it was just like, it was just the people at the events that you saw uh, at every event and and so on and so forth. But um, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't mean that to sound arrogant or whatever, but it was not really, a, it was not really something we spent a lot of time thinking about with the exception of like occasionally in the news department as more and more rumors style reporting became the norm uh, is, is it, it kind of forced us to revisit our policies around news but again that was primarily because of kotaku and the the type of reporting that they were doing that gawker style of coverage that they were that they were doing at the time was really the driving force there it wasn't necessarily um fan sites and stuff like that more often than not it was like cleaning up a, you know because sam some fan site wrote some crazy shit we had a situation oh man we got worked once uh like we were at TGS and someone took it upon them. Someone saw some news show up on some other site that was fake. I don't know like what the deal was uh, with the original story or like a fake message board post or whatever it was. But like they took it upon them. It was like, this is news and wrote it up and published it. And the whole article was fake. And it was just like, and we were at TGS and we could have confirmed this in 20 seconds. If this person had said like, Hey, can you check on this? I mean, it might've been time zone stuff. Like it might've been overnight and we were asleep, whatever. But, um, like a story went up on the site that was like complete bullshit. And you're just like, ah, oh, fuck. That's all that, that never feels good. Um, but yeah, I don't know like that. Yeah. That stuff all happened. The, the, most of the stories I have heard were around that idea of fan site editors being pressured um, into falling in line. Um, 
in a very uh, subtle or sometimes not so subtle sort of way. Um, let's see here. Ash in the UK writes in and says, I received a Qbert mini replica arcade for Christmas, and one of the features is a physical knocker that triggers when you or an enemy falls off the edge to simulate the sound of them splatting on the ground. Yeah. My question is, do you know if this was ever a feature of the real machine? Additionally, can you think of any arcade machines that have such features or similar effects? Yeah. No, yes. The original Qbert arcade. It's like a solenoid power. It's like a piston or whatever. It's like a... It's a big metal fucking rod. Uh, and those come out of pinball machines originally. Whenever you get an extra ball in a pinball machine, there's that clack of like a metal rod being forced against wood. And just goes pop and pops the wood. And it's this loud like, oh my gosh. Um, and when they were making Qbert, they thought, wouldn't it be cool if we put a fucking knocker in there out of these pinball machines uh, when anyone falls off, wouldn't that be awesome? And they were right. It was awesome. And yeah, those were in real machines. Sometimes they weren't working. Sometimes, uh, operators wouldn't put them in if it was a kit conversion or, or something like that. But, but yes, original Qbert cabinets had that and it was cool as hell. Super cool. I don't know if the other, I don't know if Qbert's cubes supports the knocker or not. The sequel to Qbert. Uh, Josh in Colorado writes in and says, I'm 37 and I've really never thought about what the up in one up meant. Of course, I know it means an extra life, but where did that term originate from and what was the first game you saw it in? Um, it's, it comes from arcade games and it comes from when you're playing a two player game, you will see the scores on either side of the screen and it will say one up and two up. Uh, that was where the term one up first period is like first player, second player was, was, was how it, um, was how it originally displayed in games. I don't know the first game to use it as an extra life thing. Is it super Mario brothers? Did anything happen back there? But I think it was the idea of you were the one up was like, it was like, Hey, you're getting another one up is getting another life here. Ideally that should have meant that if someone was playing as Luigi, uh, that it should have said two up when they got an extra life. Um, but it's the idea of first player is up. Second player is up. And then that kind of got co-opted. The, the one up terminology got co-opted for an extra life at some point along the line. It, like I said, it, it may have been, it may have been super Mario brothers that that can't be true. There has to be something earlier than that. Anyway. Um, Yes, it was originally just used to denote which player is currently playing the game. Is it first player? Is it second player? Pinball machines with their limited space would sometimes use three up and four up for their four player games and, and so on and so forth. So it was originally used to denote which player um, was playing the game or which, um, which score went to which player or whatever. And then it started getting used in, in those ways. Yeah, it looks like, yeah, potentially was first used to denote an extra life in Super Mario Brothers. Yeah, that makes sense. I can't think of anything earlier than that that used it because that's a weird use of the terminology because it was originally just like, hey, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's which player is playing the game. Okay. Let's see here. Nigel from the UK says, what console release and its initial games impressed you the most in terms of graphical fidelity? <clears throat> you know, is it SD to HD? Is it 16 bit to 3D? PS1 to Dreamcast. Uh, and Nigel says, for me, it's subjectively tied to the nostalgia of going to my friend's house to watch and play Call of Duty 3 for the first time on the Xbox 360. I vividly remember the rain and post-processing effects looking so good and the textures on the guns being so clear, so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> hmm. It's probably the move from 2D to 3D. It's probably the, the move from 
the 16-bit era onto the PlayStation and the N64. Um, that's, that's probably the biggest jump. And yeah, you did see some of that in arcades ahead of time when, yeah, you saw like Virtua Fighter coming to arcades. And, and so 3D was... And you see it in like some Sega CD games and a few things here and there. You know, virtual racing came to um, the Genesis, and and that's kind of crazy. But the frame rates were terrible. So um, to see performant 3D in a game like a Super Mario 64, um, or a jumping flash. Uh, but yeah, I think the jump from 2D to 3D is the most massive shift. In games, I think that 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 is you know everything from how we control games of running from left to right and running from or running from the bottom of the screen to the top or you know whatever like all of that changed because suddenly we were presenting three D environments on the screen, um, and so that's something that touches everything about the, that's something that leads to the standardization and rollout of analog controllers because you, you suddenly you can't just run in eight directions. You need a full 360 degrees of motion to run in all these different directions that we have access to now, right? Um, and I think that is probably the most massive shift. Um, but that's not something that's purely in terms of graphical fidelity. That, that's obviously a big part of it. But again, you know, it, it's it's a situation where because of the types of graphics we're seeing in games, the types of games then change. And so it becomes this entire shift in everything. Audio has to change because now we're thinking about positional 3D audio in a way we didn't necessarily have to before. And, you know, before too long, Dolby Surround would become a thing. And, you know, in, in the generation following that, you know, you'd have more of that showing up on PlayStation 2 and Xbox and not that it was used all that well, but it was, you know, it was something that people were starting to think about more and more. Um, and so I, I think that has to be, that has to be the biggest shift. I think that um, the, you know, th there's stuff like um, the 8-bit to 16-bit shift was, was a kind of a big deal, but you got to remember that at least in the States, it kind of slow played th through the systems where... We went from the NES to the Genesis and then to the SNES. And so by the time the SNES had come out, you know, I'd been playing 16-bit Genesis games for a while and the SNES games were oftentimes more colorful and the scaling and rotation of mode seven was incredibly impressive. Um, but it was sort of a, it was, it was a more subtle shift and you would see back in those days, the advancements in hardware would come from arcades. Whereas I think when we get into the PlayStation era and beyond, we come closer and closer to those graphical upgrades happening on PC and then filtering down to consoles after that, you know, in, in, in a way. Um, so you would see some wild shit in arcades and then you would see it come home in like a somewhat compromised format, but it was still like, oh, mm. um, it still stood out. But yeah, I think the the I think the right answer, the canonically correct answer to that, almost has to be the shift of uh, from um, the 16-bit era into the 32-bit era, the 60, you know, whatever uh, the the N64 and the PlayStation, leaving the Saturn out of that conversation because its 3D was is noticeably less impressive by comparison to the other two platforms. Um, I think that has to be it. Yeah. Um, you could make a case for, well, when it comes to graphical fidelity, like sure, the 360 was definitely a bump up from what came before, but you know, that's the start of us getting into, when it comes to graphical changes anyway, it's like, Here's a resolution bump, better textures, better this, better that. The nerbs are hotter, uh, the hottest nerbs in the game. Uh, but like, you know, like, like whatever the, the different increases in, in 3d technology. 
uh, and increased resolution and all of that stuff. It's a big deal. Like that stuff certainly matters. But once we got to, <clears throat> in a lot of ways, I think once we got to the Xbox and PlayStation 2 and GameCube, um, it's been iterative. It, 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 like the, the biggest change since then was, was taking everything online. You know, and, and that made games shift again. It was not a, a change due to graphics. But like, from a purely graphical fidelity standpoint, um, you know, once we got to the PS2 and Xbox and we started seeing first-person shooters and we started seeing the types of games we still play today um, showing up in quantity back on those platforms, um, you know, that that... that the concept of modern game design just started to coalesce and, and, and move in that direction. And then the internet changed a lot. And then the internet eventually led to a change in monetization and uh, socialization within games and, and, and all of those things. So, you know, that, that's a, uh, you could argue that that change is, is even bigger than the 2d to 3d change, but mm, mm. you don't need to correct me on the use of the word nerbs. I just like saying the word nerbs. Um, Keegan from Philly writes in and says, I love climbing in real life. It's a mental and physical challenge that takes effort to solve and is fun to figure out. So why is climbing in video games always terrible garbage trash? Yeah. Hold forward to slowly move up the white or yellow trail. Or if you want to be really freaky about it, any wall in the game, hit the A button sometimes. Congrats, you did it. Isn't that fun? Is there a way to fix climbing as a traversal mechanic in games so it isn't terrible trash garbage? Or will it forever feel like a frustratingly slow conveyor belt designed to ruin your pace and test your endurance of holding forward on a joystick? Yeah, Jusant, I, I need to play some more of that, but it, uh, that's people do seem to like that game and it does have some, some climbing in it. Um... So the problem is the solution to just make characters climb way faster so you don't have to do it as much. Do people actually like the current state of climbing in games? I'd honestly rather have a loading screen, says Keegan. Yeah, climbing in video games is terrible. This was something that, uh, you know, has pushed me away from the Uncharted games to, you know, just like a, ver a, a wide variety of games have been slowed way down by a bunch of fucking climbing. Assassin's Creed, yeah. Assassin's Creed was cool because it, it, you know, you saw a lot of probably very difficult to build systems at play uh, to make that climbing look at as effortless as it, as it eventually was. And that was kind of neat. But at the end of the day, you are still just kind of holding forward and climbing up, right? I mean, you know, it's just figures it out. To me, a climbing sequence is like a walk and talk sake sequence, but without it being a cutscene. And sometimes they do turn the, the the climbing sequences into like, oh, the lady in your earpiece is talking to you about what you're about to see and and whatever. But like, it's non gameplay in so many cases, right? Where it's just like you just fucking hold the button. But I I don't know. Like I think the Climbing was well used in the more recent Zelda games as much as the stamina and climbing wet surfaces stuff ends up being frustrating at times. I think that they do some kind of like that's a, a cool thing to have in that game. Um, and if they took all of the stamina and uh other stuff out of the climbing in in those zelda games i think that that would i don't know if you could just call you know and, and hey uh what about dragon's dogma you can climb all over those dudes you can creeble on some fools you're just creebling on up and sticking them in the throat and all that stuff. like that's some cool climbing um But yeah, when it's just, hey, you're holding forward on a joystick and you need to get up here and it's just going to take some time, that's frustrating. It's, an, it's, 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 yeah, I agree. It slows the pace of games way down. I, I don't know what you do other than don't do it, other than flatten your games out a little bit and stop fucking climbing. 
Um, I'm okay with mantling up things, but I don't want to, I don't want to slowly climb a surface. I, even when they try to make it gameplay and they're like, you got to find the pathway. Oh, you got to hold over here. It's like, oh, so I got to rotate the stick until he puts his hand out that way. And then I know when I hit a, he'll jump. Okay. That's not better. Um, crazy climber, pretty good climbing. You got two joysticks. It's hard. It's hard. As when you're, when you're seven or however old I was. Um, but yes, climbing in games is usually kind of fucking bad. Um, Max from Scranton writes in, says, Last week you spoke a bit about battle passes and the questionable habits that companies have been using. I wanted to get your opinion on the Halo Infinite time-locked entrenched event that occurred in 2022. That included a limited pass with the usual cosmetic unlocks you would expect. It didn't include a premium option, if I remember correctly, but they did sell side cosmetics in the shop related to the event. Then, they decided to include a bonus, where if you completed the pass, you got the ability to purchase a real-life bomber jacket that you could have your gamer tag on and was themed. I think the jacket was like 125 bucks without shipping or tax. Anyway... I thought that was an interesting thing for them to try, but I don't remember what the general response was for that and how many jackets they actually sold. I think that's cool. I think the physical manifestation of your, uh, your accomplishments in a game is a really neat idea. Destiny has been doing this uh, for a good long time, and I think it's a really fucking cool idea because it goes back all the way to the Activision patches on the 2600. Where if you took a photo of, if you if you achieved a certain score in some of these Activision games on the 2600, you would take a picture of the TV screen and you would mail it in and they would mail you back a patch that you could sew onto your fucking jean jacket or whatever, you fucking Hesher. Um, and I think that's cool as hell. So I, yeah, I, I, I've never, I've, I've never, I, I qualified for a couple of Atari patches, but I did it years too late. <laughs> um... But I think the bungee thing is really cool. I think that's a really neat thing for them to do. Um, and yeah, I don't know, like uh, Halo, like them selling you a jacket. I mean, you know, it helps if the jacket is cool, right? It helps if the clothing item is actually cool. And I think Destiny is a game that has had some visual design over the years. Um, that has been really awesome that I would, uh, I would consider buying as actual clothing. Um, regardless if it was accomplishment based or not, but, um, but yeah, I, I think it's a really cool idea. I, th I think it's like a, a fun thing for games that kind of have communities around them, right? Like it makes sense in a game like destiny that, that, you know, has had such a, a vocal community over the years, uh, to, to have that sort of, um, incentive. Um, I don't think every game could get away with doing it. Um, but I think it's, I was playing an iPhone game called black box the other day and I uninstalled it. Um, but it was something, it, it's like a, it was like a puzzle game and it, it eventually an icon opened up there that was like, Hey, if you complete four more challenges, you'll be able to get something in the mail. And I was like, Oh, weird. And then I, uh, uninstalled it <laughs> not long after that. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I love the idea. Uh, as long as the stuff is cool. I always go back to... I have a, a Titanfall jacket or a, like a hoodie that I bought a while ago when they were making those. Um, That's fantastic. Like, there's so much... Like, I, I think there's just a lot of bad gaming merchandise. And there has been uh, so much bad um bad gaming merchandise over the, the years. Uh, that when something actually seems like it might be like lightly fashionable and not just like, here's a logo on the front of a black shirt, um, or, or whatever, I think that that's cool. Um, do I wear the Titanfall jacket in public? I would like it. It's, it just, it has like one of the in world logos on it. It just looks like a cool jacket, like a cool hoodie thing. You know, the mass effect gear that they did was pretty similar to that and it was just it's here's some good looking here is some good looking merchandise 
And I bought like two, I, I say it all the time, but I bought like two of those, uh, two of the two Mass Effect, like a hoodie and a jacket. And then, um, and then like Mass Effect 3 came out and then I felt I couldn't wear them anymore because I disliked that game so much. I still have that stuff somewhere, but I don't, I don't, I don't feel comfortable wearing it. I don't feel comfortable repping Mass Effect. They, the last two games have done too much damage to it. Um, Troy writes in and says, I was recently talking to a friend about all the copies of E.T. found in the dump. We then went on to talk about how you don't hear too many stories of a game being hard to find or there being so many copies of a game they had to throw them out. As a supply chain professional, this kind of forecasting for a relatively new industry is impressive. Being someone that largely grew up in the GameCube PS2 era, a lot of my stories of older games are from family and professionals like you. So, my question is, were there many cases of large shortages or surpluses of other games back in the day? Are there any notable examples other than E.T.? Um, hmm. I can't think of a case where games straight up got thrown away. Uh, yeah, that's right. There was the chip shortage in, in the NES era where uh, some games got delayed and some games were then hard to find because of a shortage of, of chips. That's right. Yeah, Zelda 2 was one of those. Um, oh yeah, Rad Jago brings up the THQ U-Draw tablets. Yeah, they, they made drawing tablets for a series of, of video games that um, didn't sell and they ended up with a whole bunch of them. But a lot of that stuff nowadays, there are, there are enough retail... Like if your price gets low enough because you're go literally going out of business and you need to clear a warehouse, you can usually find a place that'll take that shit on and then a retailer throws it away or something probably. Um, <clears throat> so you don't necessarily hear about a story like E.T. where all of those games just got completely disposed of or, or whatever. Um, it's more like you'll have like specific situations where like, oh, a lawsuit means that this game can't be sold legally anymore. And so there's copies in a warehouse somewhere or, but those seem to magically find their way out to retail and, 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 or magically find their, their place somewhere. I remember, um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of discount retailers that'll take on a lot of stock too, whether it's like a five below or like a, the, the, the one big weird story I remember is trying to get a hold of a review copy of Gravity Games Street Vert Dirt for the Xbox. I believe it also came out on PlayStation 2, but I called Midway constantly and I was on them trying to get a copy of this game. Uh, because it kept saying it was coming out. Like I'm looking at retail and it's, uh, and they're like, it's coming out next week. And then it would, they would get pushed back at the last second. And then, you know, just like for the longest time, I was like, Oh, what the fuck's going on? Like there's sort of a, a weird, um, <clears throat> and, and midway is not telling me when the game is coming out or anything like that. They're just like, Oh, we don't have copies yet. Well, yeah. When we get a copies in, we'll, we'll send you one, blah, blah, blah. And, or, and then eventually I just stopped getting any, uh, like response to them about any of my inquiries about gravity games, street vert dirt. Um, and I came to find out that like the game never showed up on, cause I, I, I used to use, uh, EB games or I guess eventually GameStop uh, as my release calendar. They would be pretty good for like the next three months out or something like that. Usually their dates were pretty accurate in terms of like, Hey, we only put these dates here because someone actually told us this shit. And so we're pretty sure that as far as we know, this is when it's coming out. It could still change, but this is the latest information we have about this. Like they were, they were really good for that. Um, and so the game eventually disappeared off of that. Well, like out of that database, like gravity games just like magically never showed up. And I was like, Oh man, it got canceled. What the fuck happened? And like midway was kind of like, yeah, no, we're not gonna, yeah, we're not sending that out to, it's not, 
you know, I forget what the explanation I got was. And then like days later come to discover that Costco has scads of copies of gravity games, street vert dirt. So I think what may have happened is, and the game is shit. It's a fucking terrible video game. It's a BMX bike game is a, you know, in, in the extreme sports era when those games were coming out, it is a miserable video game. Terrible. And so I don't know if at some point midway just needed to bury it. Um, or if the retailers backed off whatever, whatever the situation was. Um, it seems like all of the copies of that game, that entire run just got dumped on Costco and just like, Oh, let's get this out of here and forget it. Let's forget this ever happened. Um, I think there's been a few games that have fallen into that category where like, yes, they exist, but they just went straight to discount retail. Like they're like a second run movie or something out of the gate. Like they never, they never made it out, uh, properly. And so Costco, so I, we had to go to Costco and buy review copies of Gravity Games Street Vert Dirt, which I believe scored some kind of one. It's real bad. <clears throat> um, but I can't think of any of the modern examples of that. You know, like f digital sales have really changed uh, a lot of the supply chain, you know, like the supply chain conversations for video games, especially for software. I mean, it's just a very different thing. And so I don't even know what the print runs are for games these days. Um, it seems like a lot of, um, with some exceptions, it feels like a lot of collector's editions of games disappear prior to launch, like they get pre-sold out, but then two or three months later, suddenly they're just back on Amazon for like a discounted price, and you're like, oh, clearly, clearly some of these were sitting somewhere. And uh, need to be moved out of a warehouse. <clears throat> but you don't hear about that uh, all that often. Oh, uh, this is kind of, we'll, we'll make this our last email. It's kind of a long one. Tristan writes in from Brisbane, Australia. I have been slowly working my way these past few years through episodes of GameSpot's On the Spot from its humble beginnings in 2004 up to the end of 2007. This brought back a lot of great memories for me as I used to watch every week when I was in middle school. I was particularly tickled by the occasional audience question from a Danny O'Dwyer from Ireland. That guy. Uh, writing in asking about his Amiga games. Uh, maybe I am just being naive or just nostalgic, but I thought there was some real charm about the program format that you don't really get from game coverage today. The live produced format with an opening sequence and structured segments, almost like a broadcast television show, along with those in-house personality driven editorial staff showing both exclusive game previews and also games they were currently in the process of reviewing. In particular, I enjoyed it when the team would go on site to game developer studios and speak to them about upcoming projects or have them call in or actually in person in the studio. Um, there was also the tie-in of GameSpot produced documentaries often centered around E3 that are this, to this day fascinating to watch I recall Kerry Guskos once referring to you all as the dream team and I wouldn't disagree it's also quite incredible when you think about what the likes of Kerry and Greg Kasavin have gone on to do in the industry and that perhaps there was an element of lightning in a bottle uh, what are your thoughts about the way that game editorial production has evolved in the last 20 or so years? That's a big question. That's a, that's a, that's a large question to, at the end of all this. And do you think that some of that charm has been lost in the process of an unenviable in, in change? Are there any aspects of that that you miss or some that you are particularly glad that have gone away? Um, I agree with Carrie. I I think that like that that team that era of of GameSpot is uh, as close to I mean you know like a take like the the people that I worked with in that era everyone was fucking super fucking good and super on their shit. You know mistakes get made here and there. I think that thing I was talking about earlier about the story that ran while we were out at TGS technically happened during that era. So, you know, like mistakes were made, but like, um, 
I, it was an amazing crew to work with. I think it was, it was a crew that, you know, like we were, there was a lot of shit to figure out. I think is the, is the actual answer. Um, you know, as we started getting more and more access to better cameras and HD broadcasts eventually and, and live streaming and, and all of that sort of stuff. Like a lot of that was Ryan McDonald who ran the video team and he ran GameSpot live and Ryan was always pushing. He was always pushing. Um, to live stream the E3 press conferences, to live stream from the show floor, to do this live, to do, you know, like it was, it was always like he, he was, he was always, always pushing really hard to try to figure out like what was going to be the next fucking crazy thing to do. And, and he would get all this gear and then have to figure it out. And, and he had his team and they would sit there and have to fucking stare at all this stuff and go like, all right, what's a TriCaster? What does this thing even do? What are we going to do with it? Um, and they would have to figure all that out. And then, you know, on the editorial end, like, you know, we weren't, um, it was a bunch of people with like, you know, with a variety of personalities, some of which came across on camera better than others. Some of, some people got better on camera over time. I say everyone, you know, everyone got better on camera over time. Um, but yeah, I think that era, you know, working with Rich and Carrie, um, course greg and you know and you know bob Kaleko and and you know it's it's like kind of some people kind of came and went over the course of it so like you know john carlo was there for some part of it and and then he split um you know brad interned uh for a while and then came in full time justin calvert moved over from the uk um and yeah i don't know greg mueller there was you know there's just a, a good wide variety of people with a wide variety of interests and skills you know even you know like bethany was there she was largely you know running community and doing forum moderation type stuff but also i pushed a ton of role-playing game reviews onto her because <laughs> she was interested in playing those games I was like, here and so there, there's yeah it was um basically up and down the roster like people were fucking incredible um and and getting better and but when it comes to you know yeah we think about like 04 and um on the spot specifically i mean yeah i i don't know like like rich gallup was a driving force for making things better in ways that we never would have gotten to on our own ever. Like he had had, you know, he, he had some film school, like he, he had done some stuff. He entered that eternal darkness. He won that eternal darkness competition, I think, or he entered it anyway. Um, so he had done some, uh, no, like, like rich came in and, um, really just, added a lot richest thing that, that, you know so so the thing i've always been able to do is just fucking wing it um i've always been if, if i if you'll allow uh I, I, that's something i've always been pretty good at doing i'm just going like i don't know turn the camera on we'll fucking figure this shit out as we go whatever um rich was the only person to ever say no we wrote it a certain way. Do it the way I wrote it, motherfucker. <laughs> like, like, you know, do it. Uh, like, we're doing it this way for a reason. Do it this way, if only to prove that you can. Um, and uh, and so he forced me to learn lines in some things uh, that I didn't always want to do. Um, but we were better for it. And I think the doing all that stuff live and having it look semi-professional was super fun because I, I, and, and my whole thing was again, as someone who could wing it, I loved it when shit broke, I was ready. If a tape broke, if they were like, Hey, this tape segment that we have for whatever reason, it's just not playing back, which happened more often than you would think you'd get like Dave tool or Dan Mahorik and you're going like, yeah, that's it. We're, it's the tape is still reminding. Uh, the tape is rewound off of the reel. We can't, uh, that, okay. We're not going to do that segment. Like, okay. All right. 
Uh, we're out here for another 12 minutes until the next thing. So we'll figure it out. You know, like I, that was always super fun to me. Um, I, 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 yeah, I don't know. Whenever stuff broke, I, I felt like that was, that was always the most fun I had doing it. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. You know, the, the, the on the spot stuff was, was really fun. It became the most fun thing to do every week. And it really changed the way we had to think about ourselves and the podcast, the, the, the hotspot also kind of dragged us kicking and dragging, uh, kicking and screaming into the future a little bit because prior to those sorts of things, um, GameSpot was thought of as a very monolithic organization. This was the GameSpot review. It doesn't matter who wrote it. It's the GameSpot review. And it would be highly uncouth for someone on staff to be speaking out publicly, disagreeing with that review. Not that there were that many places to go and do that in that era, but it was, you know, you got so much shit from kids all the time anyway, that giving them ammunition by saying like, I think the game's actually okay. You just don't fucking do it. It's not worth the fucking time. We're all in the trenches. Don't fucking do it. And, and to a certain extent, that does make some sense because it's just a fucking hassle. Like the, those, the amount of time we wasted catering to the fucking whims of those assholes of like forum kids and system wars dipshits and, and trying to button up reviews only to be called shills for like, that's a gigantic waste of time. But at the time it was just like, fuck man, we just don't, we don't want to deal with more shit than we're already going to get. So, so don't be out there fucking shit talking our own work it's hard enough as it is um but the minute you start doing a podcast or the minute you start putting people on and and no one listened to that podcast internally like we just started doing it um and when someone caught wind of like sometimes on that podcast you might i might have said a sentence like oh you know i don't like it as much as as this person did but it makes total sense why they you know like even that was like, a, hey, don't do that. And I was like, oh, okay, this is a problem because we have to be people now. Uh, we can't just be the behind the scenes. And there was like, there was talk for a while about like, let's take all the names off reviews and let's get, you know, because, because of the people being like, well, if this person had reviewed it, it would have gotten a nine. It's, it's like, okay, well, fuck you. Let's take all these names off the reviews. Go fuck yourself, which again, is something that makes sense in a vacuum in the context of where we were at at that time. But like, you know, with where things were going and whatever else, it just, um, you know, like Brian Eckberg was hired to be the sports person. And so it made sense for him to be the sports guy. And it was okay if someone else was like, <laughs> you kids and your crazy Madden, those games seem terrible. Anyway, truck stick, huh? All right. Um, like that, just kind of all sort of made sense. Um, but it was, it was a bumpy road getting from, from where GameSpot was at to that kind of different era of, of like personalities or, or, or what have you. Right. Um, but it just made sense with where things were going, you know? And, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was an amazing it was, it was an amazing team of people. You know, I, I, I look back on it and it's crazy. The, just the amount of talent and what some of those folks have gone on to do. And I used to take it very personally, the idea, because, you know, Greg Kasavin was not the first person to leave carry not either. They were not the first people to leave and go work for a, a game company. You know, that had happened a handful of times over the years. Um, and it was something I, or just leaving in general, I used to take very personally, uh, which is, it was just like, oh man, I just like, I like being around all these people all the time. This is great. Um, and so it was crushing when some of those people left. Um, but at the same time, when, when Bob Kaleko says like, I'm going to go work at Blizzard, the company that almost caused me to drop out of college because of how much fucking Warcraft I played or, or whatever. You're not going to go like, no, don't. And you're like, yeah, no, go. If that's your dream job, go, go do it. Of course. And Bob is still out there doing, he's not a blizzard anymore, but he's, he's out there making it happen. So, you know, like the number of people that went on to go work in a variety of positions, uh, kind of getting out of editorial in, in a lot of those cases. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's an amazing team. You couldn't, you couldn't do it today, uh, because you just wouldn't have enough money to have that many fucking people. <laughs> 
Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, you know, uh, it, it was cool. Um, and, and it was, it was the right time because we were getting access to all this new technology. They eventually did a deal with some television network called zoom called v v no voom. Sorry. It was called voom. And as a result of us doing a deal with voom, they were an HD network. And so they needed HD programming. And so that got us enough money to go and upgrade our entire production to HD. Um, and, and that was fucking cool. It led to us no longer wearing makeup. We, we stopped wearing makeup when, when HD happened because you could see it. Uh, and so that was kind of nice in a weird way. Uh, though we just glistened at that point. Uh, we didn't have a nice matte finish like we did before. Um, yeah, no, it, it was the, on the spot and, you know, like we, we started trying to do a cartoon, you know, we, it was me and Rich and Ryan and, uh, Ryan Davis, not Ryan McDonald. And, um, Ben Coelho did all the art for that, who Ben had come in as like a summer intern. I forget. He was, he was there to do the E3 documentary mostly. And then, and then Ben also did the, the time trotters art. And so I went back to him for art when we wanted to do review images uh, for the launch of, of giant bomb. We went back to, to Ben Coelho and said, do it in the time trotter style. Um, basically <laughs> not, not quite identical to that, but it was, you know, uh, certainly similar. Um, and you know, like there was a time there where when we could just kind of like do whatever, um, the catch is that when anything became successful, sales wanted to come in and monetize it. And um, that always got in the way, you know, the uh, rich didn't want to be in a position where he was promoting products. Um, and he was, since he was not an editorial, since he was on the video side of things, like it was like, oh, well he's fair game to, to hold up this. It was literally a Wendy's cup. There's episodes of that show where you see a Wendy's cup getting damaged and dented up and more fucked up over time. And it's because he would crumple that fucking thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I couldn't do it. I review games. Rich didn't. And so Rich ended up in a situation where he had to do some of that stuff. And now it's a different landscape and, and that would be, um, a non endemic sponsor like that. I would be all for it. Um, but it's, you know, it's a very, very different landscape back then. And so, so that happened on some, I believe that was, there was some episodes of on the spot, but like the, the tournament TV thing is the thing I always come back to is like when a thing got popular, sales would come in and screw it up or the, the requirements for a thing to be monetizable were unheard of. Like with the cartoon with time trotters, they were like, that's cool. You need to be able to make like 13 of them in a month or, you know, like, like do you need to be able to, and, and by this time, a guy who had worked at E network who had television experience, I believe was the general manager of the group. And so he was applying all of this television shit to it, which at first seemed kind of cool. Cause I was like, yes, we should get on the spot on television. One of his first big mandates was that on the spot should be 53 minutes long. Exactly. Whatever it was a, a broadcast hour. Um, and it should be exactly that long. And I was like, hell yeah. Yeah, no, let's, let's shape this up and put it on television. Cause at the time, like, you know, G4 was on the air and I would look at G4 and just go like, fuck that shit. It's terrible. Like we could fucking do way better. Like X play started as GameSpot TV. Like, well, this is fucking, this should be us. Like we, we could do this way fucking better than anything they're doing. Um, across any of their, their programming. And so the idea of like, get this shaped up for a broadcast hour, I was like, yeah, cool. And I remember asking the guys like, so are we, you know, are we going to like get this in shape and then try to pitch it to television? And he was like, oh no. Well, what, why the fuck? Then why are we, <laughs> then why are we making this shorter? Why are, why are we putting this time limit on it? And, and he had no fucking answer to it. And, uh, that guy sucked. He was, he, he, uh, also very much wanted to bring in models to read scripts instead of putting us on camera. And he did so for some of the other websites in the group. And, um, 
and the the pushback on that was great was severe and uh yeah that 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 kind of sent a lot of it crashing down rich i think had left by then or he was in the process of leaving um not long after that moving back east and uh yeah you know it, it all kind of it, it all fell apart you know like the I remember, you know, they didn't come out and say what was going to happen after Greg left. Greg announced that he was going to leave and it was a relatively short turnaround and it was like end of the year. So it was like we finished game of the year. And then I remember we all got on the phone and he told us he was leaving and then he was going to come back and he was going to be at the holiday party. And then that was kind of going to be it. And I remember telling him at one point, like, I, I want the job. I want to do this. I want to do this. And, um, like I want, I want to run this thing and be the, the editor in chief. And it was very much a, I don't remember what his response was. Um, but like, if there's a, like a boogie nights turning point, it's the eighties now and everything is like quickly going to shit sort of thing. Like that is the point in the movie. Like as soon as Greg leaves, there's an editorial leadership vacuum because they don't promote me into that position, but they don't promote Ricardo into that position. So he and I both have the same title and that leads to friction. They bring in a guy to sit in Greg's office that has no knowledge of video games or anything whatsoever. Um, and he's a nice guy, but is in way over his head immediately. There, there's just like, like everything. And, and so that was, that was, I believe Christmas 06. And so like 07, I mean, I know how 07 ends for me, but, uh, but GameSpot 2007, I remember being a fucking nightmare. Like every step of the way, it was a fucking supreme hassle. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, when, when shit went down at the end of 07, November or whatever it was, it was almost merciful in a way because it was just like, man, this place has fucking gone to fucking shit so goddamn fast. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was never the same. Um, but yeah, I, I think that crew there before that, um, Amir Ajami, who you know I think is still out there at a studio making games. Um, Jason Ocampo. Um, yeah, there there was a there was an amazing, uh, a really really solid crew of of folks there for a, for a good long time, and and I think those people like let you know I I played my part or whatever, um, but like I think those people helped define game coverage for a good long time, and I don't think that I don't think things would be the same if if they hadn't done that then if we if we hadn't done that then I guess if I can say we. Um, but at the same time, everything is so different now. Um, it's a, it's like, it, it's ancient history at this point. Like talking about it feels ridiculous because it just seems like so far fetched and such an era that is so long gone and can never happen again. <clears throat> um, and I miss that to an extent. Um, and I think it's a shame because I, I think that like, it was a, it was the right way to cover games at the time. And I think we were getting into a position where we were ready to shift with the times and ready to kind of roll with the punches a little bit and, and be like, okay, like shit's going to get weird from here on out. Like we don't necessarily know it at the time, but like, I think we would have been well equipped, but like, you know, it's a, it's an amazing team of people with incredible talent, you know? And so of course they're going to get head hunted. Of course they're going to get other opportunities and you know, of course, of course a Paul Barnett is going to see, uh, carry at E3 and, and, and go like, you should come work at, you should come out here and work at this you should, and, and steal her away and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, like, like it was only natural for, for that team to eventually split up. Like so many of them are so fucking good. Um, and it was, you know, it was kind of like the nice thing about coming back is like some of those folks were still there. Like, and you know, John Carlo has made, had made, had made his way back there after getting out and about for a lot of years. And I still think he'll end up working there again someday, somehow. Um, and you know, Justin Calvert was still there and you know, but it, it was a different, it was a very different thing at that point. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It, it was a, it was a 
great crew of people with a bunch of fucking weird stories and a, 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 a very strange time for video games and and the the style of coverage and as it changed and you know the multimedia aspects of it because you know when i when i started in 96 we were doing some video but not much and so it was it was really we were barely on camera it was really just like here's a minute of gameplay footage of a game because that's what you want to download because the internet is slow you don't want to download a video of us talking about a video game because the internet is slow. Um, and so as it morphed to more and more of that stuff and, and became much more of a, a multimedia kind of thing or whatever, like um, it was exciting. It, it felt like there was always a new challenge. It was, there was always something was always fucked that you had to like figure out how to unfuck. And, uh, and that was always really fun. Um, up until it wasn't, I mean, I don't know, like when the, when the problems started getting created for the wrong reasons, when it was like, oh, here's people who have no idea what they're doing, imposing dumb shit on us. And, and in some ways that is unifying because we are all against the fucking idiots people. Um, you can only take that for so long before you're like, I've got to get out of here. This is a bad experience. <laughs> um, but Hey, uh, yeah, it, it was, it was a great crew. I, I can't, you know, there's, there's a. Yeah, there's a, a, a hell of a group of people that, that, you know, did a lot of that stuff uh, through, through all of that time. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I guess that's my answer to what are my thoughts about the way game editorial production has evolved over the last 20 or so years? And do you think some of the charm has been lost? I, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I like, I think there's probably still charming coverage of games out there. You know, it's just, but everything is, everything is personality driven now. And so it becomes more of a thing of like, do you care about that personality or not? Which I think is where it was always going to end up. Um, it was the bet we placed in, in 2008 that that was where it was going to end up. Um, but it's so democratized now. All of the tools are in everyone's hands, and that's kind of cool. Um, because anyone can stream, anyone can, you know, if you've got something to say, you can, you can do it. And a lot of people are. And the quality is all over the place and, and, and whatever, but, like, that's fine. Um, I think that my problem is I think the high end of it now is really kind of crappy. Or rather, it's not really something you can trust the same way. Because the high end of it now is might be more into that kind of solo influencer sort of thing. And it's it's like that's a very different, like the sponsored streams, the the this and that, like the the biggest players in game coverage these days. Um you know, are, I don't, I don't necessarily view them as, as trustworthy. And that was the thing we were always trying to be like, that was the root of everything we were doing back then was like, we want to be reliable. We want to be a name you can trust. We want to be the, the, the thing that you can depend on the, the last word on the topic, whatever you want to call it. Um, Cheese shake. I, I'll, I'll address this very quickly because I'm running late here, but there was that tweet from Mike Rose a month ago about YouTubers demanding money to cover games that really made me realize how different things are now, says Cheese Shake. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, but also, if you're approaching YouTubers that do sponsored streams and saying, hey, here's a thing you should do, like, they're not editorial people. Like, they're usually going to want to be paid for that. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. As long as everyone is completely open about whatever it is they're doing and whatever their business is like, yeah, some of those people should be paid. I got an offer. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to take it. Uh, and I, there's no number on this. So I think I, I'm supposed to let them know my rate if I want to do this, but it is a paid opportunity and all it is, is I'm reaching out on behalf of publisher to see if you'd be interested in helping to promote game at launch. Add integration submitted for review, January 10th. Time set for revisions and feedback, January 10th through the 14th. Please upload your video with the ad integration on January 15th. And so it's, a, it's an ad that is 60 to 90 seconds in length, placed in the middle of your typical YouTube videos, one round of review by publisher, 
after which you will make edits if necessary according to their feedback. And yeah, cool. Like it, that, I, that's not something I would do because I think it would be highly fucking weird for me to cut into the middle of a video and be like, Hey, this video game that I either like or don't like. And you know, let's assume for that. I don't like it because that's even funnier. It's in stores now. You should really get out there and check it out. Like, man, this would be ridiculous. This would be crazy. <laughs> um, so it just doesn't make sense for, for, you know, me to, me to do anything like that, you know? Um, but like, that's, you know, I, I think that's a valid approach for that sort of stuff. Like me, I, I try, I'm, I am trying to maintain some kind of editorial style approach. Um, and so I cover games to cover games. I cover games because I think they'll be interesting to you or me or both. Ideally both. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it's uh, not everyone is in that space, right? And so a, a lot of people don't have, don't care about that. And that's fine. Uh, again, as long as everyone's being upfront about what they're doing and why they're doing it and where the money is coming from and, and, and everything you know, like I, I am, I am brought to you. Generally speaking, there are certainly some ads that show up on the podcast. Um, and those are not related to games and that's deliberate. Uh, but I am brought to you by you, right? I mean, you can go to Patreon, you go to patreon.com slash Jeff Gerstman and, uh, and th throw some money this thing's way and keep this nightmare train rolling. And, uh, and I'll keep doing it for as long as you keep wanting it. Like that's, I feel like that's the deal, right? As long as there's enough of you out there who want this thing that I can keep doing this. I would, I would love to keep doing this. If I wanted to stop doing this, I would have stopped by now. <laughs> so, uh, so clearly I'm either a complete idiot or, uh, or I genuinely love this shit. <laughs> so either way. Um, thanks everybody for your support, by the way. It's, uh, yeah, we're, we're here in a new year. Uh, feel free to, you know, yeah, check it out. Support, uh, go to, go over to patreon.com slash Jeff Gerstman and, uh, you know, sign on up. You get access to the discord. Uh, you get uh, early access. You can get early access to the, the hall of fame. Um, I have to, there's one last scheduling thing I need to check off my list before I can say this with 100% certainty, but uh, Glenn and I are going to do a live Game Boys to Men Q&A session uh, with the Discord on Thursday night, probably around 8 p.m. Pacific. Um, so get on that Discord. Or, you know, the, the aftermath will be posted to Patreon in, in some form as well if you can't make it live, but, um, but yeah, if you've got questions about 1995 or earlier, <laughs> probably about the, the, the right window of questions there, Glenn and I are setting up to take your questions there, um, on the discord. So if you're on the discord, that's it. All levels. Um, then, uh, then you'll get access to that. Um, and again, that should be Thursday barring any, there's still some scheduling just real life. There's some real life stuff happening on my end that is uh, unpleasant and uh, that uh, has the opportunity to derail uh, some things here and there. And so, uh, but, but barring any of that, which I shouldn't be, uh, I'll, I should be with you Thursday night with Glenn and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about, I don't know, we'll talk about some 8-bit Nintendo games and some other some other stuff here. And then we'll, uh, you know, after that, we'll, we'll start to get that back on track and get some regular episodes of that out there get some guests book and booked and, uh, all I was looking to book some guests late last year, but then everything with the, everything blew up with between new baby and illness and everything. So I'll reapproach those guests and say, Hey, all right, my life is slightly less crazy now. Do you want to come on the show? Mm -hmm. We'll see about getting that going. Um, all right, everybody, that's going to do it for this week's installment of the show. Thanks everyone for sticking around and I will see you for the podcast next week. And then I'll be back with some streams and some other stuff this week too. So, Hey, hang tight. I'll see you soon. Bye.